Gary, yours is this one? The trace elements. Oh, trace elements. Okay, cool. Thank yeah. you. All right, thank you. I think we got rid of these. All right. Let's go ahead and get started. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Dave Sepos. I am a managing senior mediator with the Consensus and Collaboration Program of Sacramento State. And I've been the facilitator of the Food Safety Panel since its inception. I want to welcome everybody to the most current meeting of the panel. I want to go through the agenda, go through a couple of uh, housekeeping items as we commonly do, handle some of the administrative items in the earlier part of the agenda, and then get into the main content part. First of all, uh, we have a quorum. Um, on the phone is, um, just so everybody's clear, is uh, Dave Mazzara and Ken Clock and Dr. Barbara Peterson. Um, and in a minute, we'll go around and do other introductions of the, the panels, but we do have a quorum, so we're going to go ahead and proceed. And uh, I'll hold off on, on uh, other introductions to just give a few moments, just in case any other members of the public or other staff might be coming in thereafter. A uh, couple items just really quickly for folks in the room as well as on the phone. When you're on the phone, please keep us on mute so we do not have external noise uh, either disrupting here in the room or each other on the phone. Because of that and as we get into panel deliberations on anything, I will uh, give you a few advance notices and remind you to check and make sure that you're not still on mute, those of you on the phone. Um, as always, in particular with the number, because we have three members of the panel on the phone, uh, I will in general terms, when we go into uh, q and A, I'll take a few questions and comments from the panel, and then I'll purposely pause. Even if there's a queue in the room, I'll go to the folks on the phone to make sure that uh, we're going back and forth and being equitable in that regard. With regard to public comment and engagement, as with all prior meetings, I'll give you a reminder that this is a meeting of the food safety expert panel that is open to the public and what that means in applied terms is um, at all times and for all agenda items I will open up the floor for public comment. That will be after I have uh, exhausted if you will or we have exhausted any of the comments or questions that the food safety panel has or chooses to make at a point in time. At that time I'll check in with the panel see if there's any immediate other comments. I'll then open up the floor for public comment on that agenda item. I will ask that members of the public please uh, stay as focused as you possibly can to the agenda item at hand. Uh, I will also open up the floor uh, periodically for just general comments should there be a need from the, the, the members of the public. Dave? Yes. Uh, board member Raji Barr said that she was going to call in too. I don't know if she has or not. Okay. Uh, Ms. Barr, are you on the phone? Okay. All right, so I don't know if any of you want to check in with her and see if she's still planning to do so or not. Um, just continuing that sort of facilitation approach uh, within the context of the public comment. Um, public comment can be made. Uh, the panel is under no obligation to respond to public comment. So should a member of the public choose to make a question or pose a question, you can do so. I will then check in with the panel. They may choose to weigh in and respond or they may choose not to. That is their prerogative. If uh, folks at this time could please silence your phones in the room, that would be great. Um, for those of you, I, my guess is most people have been here physically before, but should you not, if you exit out those uh, doors that are behind me that are open and sort of go down the little corridor, or you can go out these double doors, but it'll make a little more noise and head down. There's a water fountain just on your right, and you'll see a side corridor to your left, and that's where the restrooms are. Uh, we ask no food or uh, beverages that might make any stains be brought into this room other than water, so that we appreciate that if you could, please. So um, my colleague, uh, Alex Cole Smith, or Alex Cole Weiss, is not um, with us today, so we'll be doing note-taking elsewise with staff. And that, uh, what I'm going to do is uh, go through the agenda really quickly here, then I'll go around the room and do introductions, and we'll move on. Uh, in a minute, we'll just go ahead and uh, do the formalities on the April meeting summary to see if there were any comments or, or changes that needed to be made. I want to uh, give an, um, uh, uh, an immediate apology on the, uh, the timing of the, the meeting summary going out. This was my fault. Okay, so if any members of the public have a concern about the timing of the summary going out, that is totally on me. I did not get it done. 
um, as rapidly as I had intended to. So um, there have certainly been times where staff within this, the board has had had some things, but I want it to be clear, that one's on me. Um, after that, we're gonna go on to uh, a presentation on plant uptake by uh, Dr. Uh, Gary Banuelos. Then we're gonna move on to a series of updates uh, with regards to the overall process. As I think everybody here now knows, we have a consultant, GSI Environmental, that's been handling implementation of the MOU. We'll move on to general project updates. And then we'll go to um, uh, the new requests that have been made of late for uh, water, same process water use, and Josh will, from, from the board will be handling that. You'll note that, as we oftentimes do, we don't have a specific time for lunch. We're going to sort of gauge where we are on the agenda for the day and collectively decide when there's a logical breaking point to go to lunch. Likewise, throughout the day, I'll sort of check in with the panel and uh, with, uh, with staff about when it seems like a logical time to take a break. So we'll handle that. Um, any comments or questions from the panel on the agenda or adjustments? Okay, hearing none and seeing none, I'm gonna start with my left. We'll just go around the room and ask for introductions of uh, regional board staff, leadership, the panel, and then we'll move on to the rest of the agenda. Mm -hmm. uh, Will, Str yeah. uh, Will Stringfellow, science advisor to the regional board. Carl Longley, uh, members of Central Valley Regional Water Board. Patrick Palupa, Executive Officer of the Central Valley Water Board. Clay Rogers, Central Valley Water Board. Bruce Mackler, US EPA. Steve Beam, Animal Health and Food Safety Services with the California Department of Food and Agriculture. Gabrielle Ludwig, Almond Board of California. Mark Jones with the US Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, Andy Gorders with the Department of Fish and Wildlife Fresno. Rebecca Asami, Central Valley Water Board. Josh Mahoney, Water Board Fresno. Dale Harvey, Central Valley Water Board. Thank you, everybody. And then on the phone, I'll ask you to unmute yourselves so you officially can introduce yourselves, Dave and Ken and Barbara. So, uh, we'll, Dave, we'll start with you. Yeah, hi, Dave Mazzara, Department of Public Health, Food and Drug Branch. Thank you. Ken? Uh, Ken Clock with the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment. Yeah. And Barbara. Barbara Peterson from Exponent. Very good. Thank you. Uh, one last item uh, regarding just basic logistics before we move on. As always, um, we are open sort of on the web live, and we have an email address that is posted. So when we do public comment, I will always check in with Rebecca to see if any comments have come in via email. That, that is um, oftentimes the case. And we will read those into the public record uh, so that everybody here in the room and the panelists can hear real time a comment that's been sent in. So again, just a reminder, we'll, I'll be checking in with Rebecca on each agenda item to see if that's the case. All right, with that, we're gonna move on to item number two, which is the April meeting summary, dated April 25th. Um, I'm gonna check in with the panel and staff. Are there any proposed adjustments to be made to this document? Okay, hearing none and seeing none, we will uh, be adopting this meeting summary into the uh, project record as final. So with that, um, we will move on immediately to our first presentation. So with uh, Dr. Buenuelos, go ahead and open it up. And then Dr. I'll, I'll ask you to come over to the podium over here and I'll move this stuff back over to you. Or yeah, you can't do it. <laughs> All right, so let me just get you set up here. Keyboard or is that? Um, I'm gonna just be using this. Yeah, and then you'll. Um, I'll look to you to go ahead and advance it. You know, yeah. Advance it yourself, right? Okay, yeah, and then you'll need to Speaking stay stay on it pretty pretty tight. Probably. Okay. Well, good morning. My name is Gary Banuelos. I want to tell you just a couple of things about me, so you have a little bit of idea where I'm coming from, and where I have accumulated and developed this presentation. I did my PhD in Germany uh, from one of the most famous uh, plant nutritionists in the world, Marschner, and during that time, I was working with isotopes. I was the isotope specialist at the university. That was also the year when Chernobyl took place, and so I was introduced to uh, some isotopes, new isotopes that uh, were a little bit new to me, 
But what was unique about the isotopes in the Chernobyl was the plant uptake of some of these isotopes. I was unaware at that time that uh, strontium-90 was very similar to calcium. So whatever pathway was used by the plant or the tree to absorb calcium, you now had strontium-90. Then we had cesium, and cesium is very similar to potassium. So it was the same relationship. Wherever potassium was used, however it was translocated, moved throughout the plant, you now had cesium. So it demonstrated to me that the plant had a difficult time distinguishing between something that was not beneficial if it was chemically similar to an essential element. And then I heard about this place called Fresno. I mean, I'm native Californian from Monterey, and, uh, you know, being from Monterey, I'd never been to Fresno. But I assume that since it was in California, it was very similar to Monterey. I was wrong. But they had this problem that I'd heard about a little bit in Germany. I really didn't know. And it was called selenium. And so since in Germany, one of their main crops in German is raps, which is rape, or canola, and it's grown in rotation with wheat. Well, I would always smell sulfur in Germany. This is in southern Germany. And again, what that was was volatile sulfur from the raps, from the canola. So using my Chernobyl experience, I thought, I wonder if I can trick a plant in Fresno to think that the selenium, which is chemically very similar to sulfur, I wonder if I can find a sulfur-loving plant to take up selenium. So that's how I came to California, and that's how I came to address the issue with Kesterson Reservoir and working with some of our soils here in the Central Valley. And being a plant nutritionist, I came over armed with plants. So you will see throughout this presentation, everything is plant-based. But I want you to understand that the plants are only meant to be one of the tools in the toolbox. Not the only tool, but it's definitely a tool that one should look at where appropriate. And again, it's based on this concept that a plant will take up something it doesn't need if it is chemically similar or if there's a pathway that this particular contaminant or perceived contaminant can enter the plant. So that's where I'm coming from with this talk. And since Carl mentioned to me heavy metals and trace elements, I'm going to tell you all that uh, my specialty really is finding alternative crops that are drought and salt and boron tolerant. And I use plants as a tool to remove selenium from various parts of the world. And I've expanded that to the complete periodic table because once I'm in Chile, and with a lot of the mining activities that are there, we run into arsenic, we run into mercury, copper. So the elements are a little bit different, but the concept of using plants remains the same. Or if I'm in Switzerland, pristine, beautiful-looking Switzerland, one doesn't imagine them being heavy metal contaminated. Wrong. Many of their streams, waterways, are all contaminated with copper. So many years of using their copper sides on their grapes have eventually migrated and landed into the streams and now are in the waterways. Big problem in Switzerland. And then when I go to China, we have 15 periodic tables of every element known to man. And this is just in the inorganic world. So I'm pretty busy over there, again, recommending different cropping systems. Again, just one of the tools that I can use. Go to India, I run into selenium. And when I go to Central California, 
And then again, I'm looking at salts, and I always examine the complete periodic table because if I feed any of these plants to animals or if we consume any of these vegetables, I need to know what else is in the plant material. Hence the reason that I look at the complete periodic table. So with that introduction, I will begin if this changes. No. Technical difficulties already. Yeah. Yeah, we're having issues with these other computers. Yeah, this is very right. barely going on. Yep. Okay. Okay. So here we are with trace elements. You're going to hear this concept of trace elements, heavy metals, and uh, I'll be using those interchangeably. There'll be positive trace elements and negative trace elements. And um, of course, trace elements always get a bad rap. And um, you know, we kind of lump them together as heavy metals. And you can see some of the elements that we'll be talking about today. And again, when we look at metals, there's basically three different types of groups here. There's our metals, the nonmetals, and the metalloids as you look at the uh, periodic table. And uh, I won't go through, this is just basic description of the uh, definition of a metal. And then our nonmetals, again, some basic description of the nonmetals. And then our metalloids. And again, the same thing. So if we divide the periodic table into those three groups, metals, nonmetals, and metalloids, this is comprised, this comprises what we oftentimes find in our environment, whether they're natural occurring or whether they result from other activities. And you're going to see some of the different sources that actually contribute trace elements to our environment. And again, some of the obvious ones. Again, in different parts of the world, and uh, especially when I work in North Africa, but even in innocent Monterey, Fort Ord, um, I find a lot of the lead and antimony problem um, in all those sand dunes where they worked for so many years shooting into the range there. Had I worked with the USDA in Salinas, uh, which is where I originally wanted to be, I would have investigated this because my fear is that eventually a lot of that ammunition that was shot into the sand dunes will eventually find itself into the bay. And again, when we look at extreme cases, uh, you can see again, these are all sources of trace element to the environment. And let's not forget agriculture. I work for the USDA as a plant soil scientist, but uh, we have our obvious, you know, where we're using plant growth regulators, our nitrates from the manures, and as well as the antibiotics that are used for the animals. In China, that's the number one contaminant in their waterways with all the pigs are the antibiotics. It's worse than their trace elements. And then, of course, the obvious, which the California grower leads the way as far as being more protective, is the excessive use of the whole chemicals. And let's not forget the planet Earth. And, uh, you know, a lot of these trace elements are natural occurring elements. They're in our soil, depending on the geological origin of our soils. And here in the Western United States, with a lot of our Cretaceous-type shale originating from marine-type sediment, which are naturally deposits of many of our trace elements. And here happens to be a place that I often go to in China. Those are actually uh, carbonate deposits of selenium. So it's a selenium mine, so to say, here. And evidence of that is when I go into the neighboring uh, villages that consume the food that's produced on these type of soils. And there you see the selenium toxicity, which is basically loss of the hair, fingernails, and teeth. 
And let's don't forget, uh, which we don't have too much here in California, but a lot of the mine tailings and uh, uh, when leaded gasoline was around, but there's still a lot of uh, contaminated soil sites. When I've gone to some previous military installations here, be it in Hawaii or California, and I evaluate the soil quality, you still see residue of the lead. Our biosolids here in California are relatively clean. Uh, I've conducted a few biosolid experiments, but I really had a difficult time finding dirty biosolids in California. And when I say dirty, uh, those loaded with heavy metals. And when you look at some of the typical mining operations, you will also see deposits of the arsenic and copper and zinc and manganese. And in Chile, this is uh, very apparent. And many of those end up in the atmosphere. And so when I analyze a lot of the, the dew from the fog, you actually have deposits of arsenic being distributed throughout many parts of Chile. I go to Chile frequently because it's our South American California. And of course, we receive many of our food crops from Chile. So I'm always interested to know what's in their plant material. I never know if trace elements is one of those groups that's evaluated. We evaluate the types of chemicals that are being used, but the natural occurring trace elements, that may be one that slips underneath the radar. And in California, and especially in California, since we are the top irrigated agriculture producer in the world, and when we used to have water, it used to be called irrigated agriculture. And irrigation has a major effect on what's in the soil. California is the leader as far as irrigation management. We have finally learned that we have to leave the furrow and flood world and uh, stop using excessive amounts of water. It's just not there and the price is too high and that you will see that um, most of the crop production is now in su uh, surface and subsurface drip, which is definitely the smarter way to irrigate because irrigation does have an effect on the solubility, mineralization, and movement of whatever's in the soil. And again, I'm speaking here predominantly today about inorganic but let's don't forget the sister of inorganic, and that will be also any of the organic compounds that are present in the water. So whatever we're affecting in the inorganic world, we will also affect in the organic world. And then in extreme examples, it's the California snow, which we have in central California, and that is the uh, evaporation ponds, which we used to use here to dispose of our excessive drainage water. And uh, those were great samples to analyze for the complete periodic table. And the TEs or the trace elements, you know, they are a threat or can be a threat. I don't like to just automatically um, label them as, as the victim or the culprit here, but in excessive amounts in our soils and in our groundwater, which eventually ends up into our crops. Uh, and so the transfer from soil to plant to human can take place. And I'll be giving you some examples of how that happens. Again, the plant has elements that are called essential elements. And there are particular pathways or doors on the root system that will accommodate these essential elements. But if there's an element that can use the door of an essential element, the element will enter the plant through that door. And I'll be showing you some examples of that, which is how we actually get uptake or accumulation of unwanted trace elements. And then we have the obvious uh, relationships that are made sometimes with excessive amounts of trace elements with the arsenic is Cancer-causing, I, I hate to lump everything into cancer-causing. Let's just say it's a participant in that whole process. 
And uh, one example of that, which we don't see here in California, is in uh, Bangladesh with some of their excessively high arsenic levels. Well, we've all heard of zinc. Zinc is one of those essential trace elements. And um, zinc and cadmium kind of walk hand in hand with one another. And also, in the plant world, zinc and cadmium also work antagonistically with one another. If we have cadmium in the soil and we have low amounts of zinc, then we will have a higher accumulation of cadmium. And it goes vice versa. We can induce zinc deficiencies with excessive cadmium in the soil. So one way to reduce the uptake of cadmium, if cadmium is in the soil, is to agronomically add more zinc to the soil. And it inhibits the uptake of cadmium. And from my area in Monterey in the Salinas Valley, which we all know is um, like an assembly line for lettuce and broccoli, and contains one of the most beautiful soils in all of California, that rich organic manner. But they farm 365 days a year. And they also fertilize. With every crop rotation, more fertilizer is applied. And cadmium, depending on the quality of your phosphate fertilizer, is always found in small quantities with your phosphate fertilizers. So if you're saving money as a grower and using a poor quality pea fertilizer, you're also adding more cadmium to the soil. In addition, the parent rock material that exists in the Salinas Valley also contains naturally high levels of cadmium. They're immobilized in the rock material. But again, when you start making changes to the soil, oxidation, reduction, wet, dry, rain, killing, you start to waken the sleeping monster in slow amounts. And cadmium will also be reduced. It's in the riverbeds and eventually migrates into Monterey Bay. In some of my travels in Asia, uh, rice, of course, is one of the most consumed product there. Uh, rice also accumulates cadmium and especially under flooded type conditions. I haven't seen that in, uh, in Sacramento at all, where we do have rice production still going on. But I do subsample there and just do monitoring just for my own interest. It's not a requirement for the USDA, but it's something that I look at. <clears throat> and one of my favorite plants to work with, which I'm not allowed to with the uh, government because it doesn't look good that uh, I'm working with tobacco. One of my ever, another favorite plant I like working with is cannabis sativa. It's changed a little bit now, that's uh, perception here in the United States, but both of these plants are very good at accumulating cadmium. <clears throat> so if you don't kill yourself with the smoke, then at least you lace your lungs with cadmium, depending on where the tobacco was grown. But I use tobacco not here in the United States, but in other countries in cooperation with others. So it's all under their name and not under my name. But I use it to remove cadmium from the soil. Again, looking at this natural absorption of cadmium in tobacco and then using the tobacco or the hemp to clean the soil. And you know, there's different conditions that stimulate the absorption of cadmium, and that's the lower pH. And in our soils here in California, we don't have the slow pH. In, uh, in Fresno County, you know, we're dealing with 8.4 to 8.6 uh, pH. So even if cadmium was present in the soil, at those high pHs, we wouldn't get any uptake. And it's important to keep that in mind, the influence of soil characteristics we may have high total concentrations 
of particular metals or trace elements in the soil, but they may not be mobile. And again, cadmium is a very good example. We may have high total cadmium concentrations in the soil, but at the high pH, it remains in the soil. It's not taken up by the plant, it's not solubilized, and it doesn't move. So you have to be careful in saying that you have a toxic situation because you really have to look at the complete picture, which involves looking at soil characteristics. And then we have arsenic. I'm always looking for arsenic. That was one that I looked at in the evaporation ponds. Again, in the Hanford area, some of their groundwaters are naturally high in arsenic. Uh, and again, the interesting thing with arsenic, or another form, arsenate, the way it enters the plant is through phosphate. So if you imagine there's a phosphate door on the root that's there for the purpose of an essential element, phosphate, arsenate will enter the phosphate door, and that's how it enters the plant. So knowing that, one way to reduce the uptake of arsenate would be to make sure that I had additional phosphate to the soil. Because the more phosphate in the soil, will outcompete the arsenate to enter the plant. So it's one of those fertilizer tools that I would utilize to reduce arsenic accumulation if present in the soil. And arsenic is, the problem is, is in many areas like I had previously mentioned, but uh, uh, especially in uh, Chile, where I spend a lot of time, and in Bangladesh, where I've seen this. And these are just some typical uh, sources of arsenic. Some are natural, but arsenic was also used in many wood preservatives. And so a lot of our fences, the older built fences, also contained arsenic. And let's not forget lead just because of the many years of when we did use lead gasoline, but a lot of the military sites where we had excessive leakage or one could dispose of things maybe the way you wanted to back then. And uh, so in some of those soils, um, it's worth looking at the lead concentrations Again, some of our older military sites, and that's why I list, for example, Fort Ord. And it's amazing, but you know, one of the major ways how we get the transfer of lead into the soil to the human is actually soil particles on your tongue, in your mouth. It's an actual ingestion of lead. And there you can see also that I've stated that uh, if, we have, um, if we have low P levels in the soil and there is lead in the soil, we also will get a higher uptake of lead. And lead is one of those elements that I'm really not sure how it enters the plant. I'm really not sure which doorway it enters. I will find it in the roots, and many times with lead, it just doesn't move to the upper part of the plant. But again, if we're growing types of crops like our onion, our garlic, and any of our tubers, or any of our sugar beets, then of course those are grown directly into the soil, and there would be a possible transfer. And really what makes a trace element toxic, it really depends on the bioaccumulation in the plant, in the human, and what type of toxicity, if at all, is being exhibited, and its persistence. How large is the total reservoir of the particular trace element in the soil? Because it only becomes potentially toxic when it becomes bioavailable, which means it's available for the plant to take up, or there's some type of movement, 
be it lateral, vertical, and if it enters any of our shallow groundwater. So groundwater quality uh, is something that we always need to look at, something that I look at, especially when we were experiencing our extreme drought. We had a lot more drillings going on. Other sources of water were being used that normally had not been used. And again, we have a natural occurrence of many TEs in some of these soils in Central California. So it was important, and probably one of those factors that slipped by many people, is to look at our groundwater quality to see actually what were we applying to the soil, to the plant, that would eventually end up in the human and or animal. And like I mentioned, the bioavailability of trace elements, it really depends on some of the soil properties, the soil chemistry. And as I've mentioned here often, the soil pH. And then organic matter. So the organic matter would determine how much is being complexed and held in place. But organic matter is one of those substances that's not there forever. It eventually is broken down into smaller particles. Once the breakdown degradation takes place, then whatever metal was complex to the organic matter is now being released. And don't forget the role of the micro, micro communities, our microflora, the microbial activities. And there's always a relationship that exists between organic matter and the type of microbes and the type of plant species that are growing there. And the microbes, as they degrade the organic matter, also unwillingly and unknowingly also contribute to the bioavailability of some of these complex trace elements. But the poor plant isn't defenseless. It does, if it's able to, it will not take up something it doesn't need. But as I mentioned, there's so many pathways that the heavy metal or the trace element can enter the plant that the plant has no way to control that. So we're really dependent on the soil chemistry and its property. But one thing that a plant does to protect itself is what we call senescence. And senescence means leaf drop. So particular leaves, usually the older leaves first will accumulate. They will accumulate the heavy metal. And then as a way to protect the plant, then they will drop or lose their leaves. Of course, the heavy metal doesn't disappear. It's just redeposited to the soil, bound to an organic form. You have a temporary management in the sense that the organic matter is holding the metal. But again, once that degradation in the organic matter takes place, then the whole cycle begins again. But the plant is trying to protect itself if it's producing fruit or an edible portion, it tries to protect itself by accumulating the heavy metals in the leaves before it enters the fruit or the edible portion of the vegetable. And the TE usually enters through the roots. Unless we are in Chile, for example, then we have deposition by the fog where it actually lands on the leaf surface and then we have absorption taking place through the little pores on the leaf called the stomata. And, but that isn't the case here in California when I've done fog samples. Or it's one thing that Fresno can say is that we have an ample supply of fog at certain times. And when I've sampled the fog just to see if I could find any trace elements, um, it was just mainly noise. And if there was any soil particles, then it's possible that I was analyzing a wind-blown soil particle. But in Chile, you can actually measure the arsenic, the copper, the mercury in the atmosphere. So these are the doors that I was talking about. This is what uh, a lot of my work is based on. If you look at the root, there's a specific door for sulfate. Sulfur, this is how sulfur enters the plant. 
Selenium is a cousin to sulfur. The plant can't tell the difference. So if we have selenium in the soil, and if we have a plant that likes sulfur, and sulfur, again, is one of those essential nutrients, selenium will enter the plant. And this is the basic concept of how heavy metals enter the plant. They will look for a door that will allow them to enter the plant, and depending on the concentration of that specific door, let's say, for example, if it was a phosphate, and we have a low P level in the soil, and we have arsenic in the soil, you will get an accumulation of arsenic in the plant. So these are some typical relationships. We have selenium and sulfate. Those two will work together, or shall I say, the selenium will enter through the sulfur door. Phosphate and arsenic, as you've heard me mention, again, the same concept. With high zinc, we can reduce the uptake of cadmium. Just the opposite takes place with chloride. So if we're dealing with salty soils or if we're using poor quality water that contains salinity and there is cadmium, you will actually promote the uptake of cadmium. But again, bear in mind, cadmium needs a low pH. So we have a natural management strategy in central California with our high pHs. So despite the high chloride concentrations in the soil, despite a reservoir of cadmium in certain areas, the high pH protects the plant from accumulating cadmium. And then I have found uh, very interestingly with the selenium and mercury uh, that I can actually um, reduce the accumulation of mercury by applying selenium. Selenium is against the law in the United States to apply, so this is an experiment that uh, I don't conduct in the United States, but in other countries where selenium is actually a fertilizer in many parts of Europe and in India and China, uh, I can actually see a reduction in mercury uptake. We've also seen that with fish. Some of the fish ponds that I look at in China where they're raising fish, the waters contain the arsenic and the mercury. So I've suggested to them of not adding selenium fertilizer, but adding selenium plant material to the waters so that we can actually increase the selenium concentration in the fish. And we've seen a reduced accumulation of mercury. I'm not a fish man, but it's of uh, great interest to me uh, of looking at this other potential benefit of selenium. If you find a plant that's growing in a soil that contains a high metal content, most likely that plant has some type of tolerance. And beside just accumulating the metal and stuffing it in what we call the garbage can of the plant material, which is a little vacuole. A vacuole is an empty storage unit within the leaf, and a plant tends to throw a lot of unwanted compounds in the vacuole. Another strategy is plants will exclude the metal. For example, like lead, it just refuses to take up lead and you will just find it in the roots or in those parts of the plant, tubers, sugar, uh, sugar beets, the one tends to eat. But it will not allow the element to be transported upward. And then we have other plants that are actually called accumulators. And these are very interesting plants, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about them. They're called hyperaccumulators. And they actually have the ability to hyperaccumulate to excessively high concentrations. And, but the normal way of metals is, as you see here, that the plant tries to keep the metal out of the transpiration water, the, out of the cytoplasm. It's kind of like the blood. And um, because that's when it causes damage, once it's in the cytoplasm. So the plant will try to attach other types of compounds, which were the ligands or other compounds, 
that will disguise the metal from the plant and will also reduce the metal's ability to damage the plant. The metal is still in the plant, but the plant has developed a mechanism to protect itself. Of course, if we eat the plant, then we still absorb the heavy metal. So you have to realize that we have plant protection and then we have human protection. So whatever the plant does to the metal doesn't protect the human, but it does protect itself. And as I mentioned, the metal usually will be stored in what we call the vacuoles. This is just some examples of um, some x-ray photography that I've done. And uh, every place that you see is green happens to be nickel. And if you were to look closely at the cells, these are all the vacuoles, the garbage can of the plant. When it is not stored in the vacuole, you'll start to see toxicity symptoms like this. And again, heavy metal toxicity that takes place that also has effects on the vegetation. And as I mentioned, there are special plants called hyperaccumulators. And these are very interesting. These are like uh, heavy metal bombs because they contain concentrations up to 10,000 ppm, 15,000 ppm, which um, in the normal plant world, if you were to exceed 5 to 10 ppm, you would kill the plant. So these are special types of plants where they accumulate excessively high and they're able to survive. Again, if you were to eat one of these hyperaccumulators or if you were to provide the plant material from a hyperaccumulator to an animal, then of course you would expect that you would cause some type of toxicity to take place in that organism. But this is where we first found this. It's very interesting. This is in uh, Caledonia. And uh, in this particular tree there, it's almost in the latex that comes out of the tree, it's like 26% nickel. It's, that's just unbelievable. It's a tree that's doing your phyto mining, so to say. And uh, it's another way how to extract nickel from the soil. So, of course, there's a lot of nickel in that area. But this is our true definition of a hyperaccumulator. And there's nothing so special about them except for they can survive, but they can be growing in soils that contain, if you were to have a vegetable and a hyperaccumulator growing next to one another, the hyperaccumulator would still accumulate anywhere from 1,000 to 10,000 ppm, while your vegetable grown right next door would not accumulate more than 1 to 5 ppm. So they're extremely efficient in absorbing and safely accumulating these high concentration of metals. And then you have to ask yourself, why? Why are they able to do this? Well, it's also interesting when you look at these hyperaccumulators throughout the world, I never see insects. I never see animals around them. No one wants to touch them. No one wants to eat them because the concentrations are so high. But, you know, that takes a lot of energy for the plant to be able to do that, to accumulate something that's not even essential and to safely accumulate such high concentrations. And as I said, we're not quite sure why, but it may have been just one of those defense systems to protect itself from herbivores and pathogens and bacteria. When I analyzed the microbial community around the hyperaccumulators, I'm not a microbiologist, but uh, I have a difficult time finding high populations of anything that's biologically active. These are some examples. They look like perfectly harmless looking plants. The lecipe, the pennycress, and sandwort, and sea pink. I mean, there's nothing exotic. They look like beautiful looking plants. And uh, one reason they are so beautiful that there's no insect will attack them, and no animal is near to eat them. It's only the human that picks the flower and says, oh, this looks nice, and then hopefully the human 
doesn't put that in the salad because then it's a heavy metal bomb that the person has just consumed. And again, these are just different harmless looking hyperaccumulators. But again, the amount of zinc that you can find and also certain varieties of cadmium. These are some that I work with. These are selenium hyperaccumulators. And uh, the amount of selenium that they can absorb is, is amazing. But there's no animal that will touch them. But the interesting thing, the one down below, the princess plum with the beautiful yellow flower, which I grow, well, I grow on research plots. I'm too frightened to grow it in Central California. I don't want banuelos to be known for killing uh, animals because, you know, an animal by mistake would eat this, but usually because of the high selenium concentrations, they don't touch it. But where I did have concern was the bees love these plants, the flowers, the perennial plants. So, of course, I was worried that Banuelos was now affecting or killing the bee colonies in California while he's trying to clean the soil. Uh, so, I don't use this plant in California. I'll use it in other sites, but our agriculture is much too valuable. And bees is such a sensitive topic. Um, but the bees, they, it's very interesting because the amount of gas that these plants are producing, it's about, uh, I know you don't know in the gas world, but it's 1,000 micrograms per meter squared every 24 hours. That's like uh, 300 rotten eggs. Uh, the perfume that you smell from a rotten egg is what the gas smells like from the selenium gas. But it doesn't phase the bees. So there's something with the bees that they're not able to register the selenium gas. There's also lead accumulators. And again, you can see where I'm going through, where I'm going with this is that I'm looking at not only these concentrations in our normal crops, but I'm also looking at the ability of certain plants to hyperaccumulate with the hope that I can actually use these plants as one of my tools to manage heavy metal concentrations in the soil. And one that I do work with a lot in other countries is the fern, the innocent looking fern. Well, the fern also accumulates excessively high concentration of arsenic. Now, I knew I would have a difficult time convincing the Central California growers to want to grow ferns as a crop, especially in some of our high pH soils. But I did think about it in the Hanford region where we do have the high arsenic groundwaters. I thought, I wonder if we can use this as a source of irrigation water, grow ferns, and use the ferns to remove the selenium, I mean the arsenic. Well, then, of course, I've deposited the arsenic on the soil, so it would have to be a continual management scheme of growing ferns. But they do work, and I've, I've seen it in other countries, and I have this going on in Bangladesh right now in the high arsenic waters. But typically, for most plants, you'll see the accumulator plant. Uh, that means it will, depending on pH and soil chemistry, the plant will slowly accumulate the heavy metal. We have other plants that we call bioindicator plants. That means that they also accumulate it. And then we have excluders that just do not take up the heavy metal up to a particular concentration, and then the concentration exceeds the plant's ability to exclude, and it also will eventually be taken up by the plant. So you have to be careful when you're throwing out this expression of heavy metal accumulation because it isn't necessarily being accumulated. You really have to look at the complete picture, the plants, the crops, the soils, and the soil chemistry. These are just some innocent looking plants also that refuse to take up heavy metals. The one that would be of interest, especially in California in the alfalfa world, is the bird's foot trefoil. Again, a uh, very nice plant that uh, I work with. Uh, it's the protein content is excellent. It's an excellent replacement for alfalfa. 
And so I always had it in my toolbox that if we were to find a heavy metal in some of our alfalfa producing regions, then I would suggest growing the lotus corniculatus or the bird's foot trefoil. Again, those were all plants that we could grow when we had water because the amount of water that alfalfa needs is, is tremendous. But I use the hyperaccumulator as one of my tools. I use it to try and clean the soils. And you have to make a distinction of what's in the soil. We also have a total metal content, and then we also have a soluble metal content. And it's the soluble portion that is bioavailable. So you don't judge the soil by its total content, because it may be so complex that it's not available, and the odds of it becoming bioavailable are also very slim unless we have some drastic changes taking place to the soil. And uh, these are just some of the examples of what I've already spoken about of um, uh, different plants that I use to remediate, including the willow tree. It's very good at accumulating cadmium. And um, I will also use the plants, and then I will also look always at the microflora, the microbial communities, because I'm interested in what's cooperating with the plant on helping to increase solubility and uptake of the particular heavy metal. And a lot will always depend on what type of crop we're using. You can't just lump all crops together because associated with every crop is a different set of microbes. And depending what comes out of the plant's roots, which are various sources of sugars, will also determine the type of microbes that are associated with that plant. So the microbes work hand in hand with the plants. And that's what's interesting when we also have organics in the soil. And I'll just speak a little bit about the participation of plants and organic degradation because in some of our soils where we have high TCE levels and also high salinity levels and also high boron levels, we have a compound problem. You know, it's in the real world, it would be nice to say we only have cadmium contaminated soil or cadmium contaminated water. Usually you have Pandora's box. You have a variety of compounds. So I either have to look at which compound I will prioritize as the compound I'm looking at, and or can I find or identify plant or tree species that can work on also an organically and inorganic contaminated soil or water. And then one of the favorite tools that I use is the poplar tree. And the poplar is, um, it's so interesting because now in China, it's the number one tree. And I'm not saying it's because of me, but I did show them that poplar is one of the fastest growing trees, can be grown, cut, harvested, but the microbes that are associated with the roots are tremendous. And they possess the ability to degrade particular organic compounds that the plant, the tree, can actually take up. And then you harvest the tree, harvest the biomass, you've managed the organic contaminant in the soil with the use of the tree plus all the extra benefits of growing trees. And what's important when you use the plant world beside being patient, one thing that most Americans don't possess compared to other countries when you look at remediation technologies is that it takes time with plants and trees. And we also have something that's very important is we always have to have some type of cash value. When I first started research here in California, I didn't, I left the small world of Europe and Germany, came back to the real world of central California, where when I was looking at my field sites, I had to rent an airplane. It was beyond the ability to walk. But the thing that I always ran into was, Gary, 
Well, beside them asking me whether I was legal or illegal with that last name, Banuelos, with some of the farmers, um, we, didn't have Cali we didn't have IDs back then, uh, was that how much money can I earn? And I kept hearing that, the economics. So every plant or tree that I now look at, say in the last 15 years, I always look at what's the cash value. What can the grower earn from growing this crop even while he's managing the particular problem at hand? And biomass does have commercial value. And, uh, and I'll discuss that a little bit in its use for gasification or for biofuel production. Biofuel was one of those words uh, during the Obama administration that uh, um, was used quite frequently and I thought would be a big boom to my research since I had developed the first biofuel plant in, uh, in Central California. Um, but the oil prices didn't go up higher. The PG&E costs to process my seed became so high that it was a losing proposition to establish biofuel plants in Central California. But as I mentioned, the poplar tree, I really like it a lot. We use it in uh, many different countries. And again, it will find its water. It has a very aggressive and assertive root system. So irrigation, I mean, we have to have some water, of course, in a deeper profile. But it's not one of those plants that needs to be irrigated. It will find its water, and it will accumulate the boron or the cadmium. And these are just some examples of the poplar tree. This is only one year's growth. I uh, harvest them every year after five meters in height. Uh, that's a lot of biomass there. I grow them for different cuttings so that I can plant in various parts of the world and in the country, the poplar. And uh, while you cut, you remove the contaminant that's in the soil. Here's larger poplars again in New Zealand. We're cleaning up boron contaminated soils. But it's a very nice plant to work with. And the willow works in the same way. And again, we can clean soils, manage soils, excuse me, of various TEs. And these are just some examples. Uh, here we are going through harvesting. This was looking at the effect of different densities. These are only about three months old, but you see how quickly they grow. And we grow the plant, we remove the plant, and Depending on what metal is in the soil, we can either line, like our lined evaporation ponds, landfill areas, and deposit, again, depending on which metal is at hand. Or we can actually combust or burn the plant material and produce bioelectricity. And this is just an example of one of the hyperaccumulators that I use for selenium. I feel very confident in saying that in one year that uh, I can clean the soil down to a depth of 30 centimeters of at least 20% of uh, selenium. And that's, again, uh, pretty amazing. Again, it's in the plant material and it volatilizes. I have to importantly mention that even though selenium or some of these other compounds like mercury are found in the volatile form, you never remove them. All you do is you distribute them in a volatile form, and of course they land someplace, and the whole cycle begins over. Plants and trees are only a management tool. They do not permanently remove any contaminant, so you have to bear that in mind. And hence the reason when I first started, I called this concept phytoremediation. More realistically, it should be called phytomanagement. And these are just some of the examples with the canola that I was talking about, the brassica. You know, we're growing it out here in the west side. You can see my experiments are rather large. Uh, soils are very hot in salt, boron, and selenium. And I'm uh, growing the plants. We'll harvest the plant. And now we have a selenium-enriched forage, uh, which I feed to the dairy cows for their source of selenium. 
and from the seed, then I will actually go through and produce the biodiesel. But it became so expensive pressing the seed to make the biodiesel that uh, it really, from an economical perspective, it's not worth it. From an idea and concept, it's a very good idea of using our poor quality soils to produce biofuel instead of what was initially suggested, replacing our corn and soybeans in the Midwest and growing plants for biofuel. It made more sense to use our marginal soils here in California. And these are just other plant, other crops that I look at. Again, I told you I'm always looking for alternative crops. This is one I've been working with for the last 10 years, the prickly pear. Very nice plant. I don't need to irrigate. It absorbs its water molecules from what little is in our dry, arid oxygen atmosphere. It also removes the um, selenium. I use it for selenium and boron removal. And it protects itself. It doesn't deposit anything into the fruit. So as long as you're just making jamba juice from your prickly pear fruits or eating the fruits, you're eating a perfectly safe fruit even though it's grown in a contaminated soil. Some of my larger experiments, this is down near Kettleman City, near the place called Westlake Farms. That's one of the old evaporation pond. Everything that's white there is part of the periodic table, it's salt. The rows of plants there are my biofilters. So before the water is allowed to enter the evaporation pond, I irrigated my plants, and these are different plant species, that would remove boron, any arsenic, and selenium before it went into the evaporation pond so that when the birds did land in the evaporation pond as they're flying south, uh, at least the water that they're spending their time on, depending on the species, there'd be a reduced accumulation. This is a plant I've been working with the last three years. It doesn't win a beauty contest. But it's a very interesting plant, and it's called Waiuli. And it's typically grown in Arizona. And what is so unique about this plant, besides being drought tolerant, salt tolerant, boron tolerant, and accumulating anything I don't want in the leaves, what we harvest from the plant is this stuff. This is latex. So if you were to imagine a rubber-producing tree, like those that used to be planted in Sri Lanka, uh, this plant produces latex. Bridgestone and Pirelli have an extremely high interest because the quality of this is much different than the rubber that they synthetically produce. And uh, it's very useful for people that are allergic to the latex. This plant produces a special quality latex. So it's uh, very interesting. So I've been working on this for the last three years. Again, one of the problems I have is the plant is not pretty. And as primitive as many people think growers are, they take a lot of pride in what their land and their crop looks like. And my most difficult selling point is to convince a grower to grow a crop that looks like this on their marginal soil, even though they can produce something like this. And then even on some of the old mining sites, again, arsenic, mercury, cadmium contaminated. I know it's hard to believe that you can grow plants, but you can. And I'm not going to clean the mountain, but as we know under real conditions, soil in the real world is not uniform. We always have so-called hot spots. Uh, here at this one particular site, I've identified, this happens to be over in Virginia, and I've identified some areas that had extremely high concentrations of uh, arsenic and manganese and zinc, and I'm able to apply some organic matter and grow crops. And what I'm trying to do is stabilize. So this would be phytostabilization, stabilize the movement of that particular trace element. And again, you know, you ask, well, what do you do with the plant material, Gary? It sounds great. You're stabilizing, you're managing, and you're removing. You know, what do you do with the plant material? Of course, that's always the question. And I really can't make any suggestions until I analyze the complete periodic table 
in the plant material. Down in five points, we have uh, this firm, Biodeco, one of the first here in Central California. Uh, what they do is many things, but they produce different forms of energy, different forms of electricity. And one of the ways is what we call gasification, where we're actually combusting the plant material. And again, like I said, we never destroy the heavy metal. All we do is we transfer it. And even in a situation like this, where we're combusting and producing electricity or another source of energy, we still have the heavy metal. But now, at least, it's in the ash material. Now it's leased in a smaller volume. Now we have a means to at least buy ourselves time and ask ourselves, what are we going to do with this heavily metal-laden ash? One other way that I also manage um, contaminated waters, whether we're looking at surface waters or irrigation water or groundwater, is the use of wetlands. And wetlands are very interesting also. I really never knew the value of them. But, you know, you can design floating systems for different types of canals with different types of plant species that actually will absorb, and this is also goes for organic compounds, but they actually will absorb and accumulate the soluble concentrations of the heavy metals. And then you will go through and harvest your plant. These are just examples of how I'm evaluating different plant species to clean up water. Again, just different types of wetland systems. When we go out into the real world, then we actually will go ahead and plant them in different types of wetland cells. Here is the famous uh, cattail. And then you can design systems like this. I do a lot of wetland work in, uh, in China, less here in the United States, and definitely less here in California, because I always have the fear of fish and birds. I'm just uh, too sensitive from the late 80s when we had all the reportings taking place. But in other parts of the world, and especially in China, the wetlands are a very useful way for managing heavy metals in the water systems. And these are just some other plant species that I use. I've evaluated different plant species. You know, I really have, I'm like a restaurant, Gary's Restaurant. I have a menu. You tell me the metal. You tell me what you eat in that area. You tell me about your soil. You tell me a little bit how you think. And then I look, based upon my experience, what type of crop or cropping system I would suggest. And I have one of those that I use for different parts of the world, whether I'm looking in salty soils in Chile, you know, whether I'm looking at the arsenic contaminant in Bangladesh, whether I'm looking at the copper-laden soils in Switzerland, whether I'm looking at our soils here in Central California. It's, it's a menu. I can't just suggest growing hyperaccumulators because the farmer has to be able to have a cropping system. And if you want anything on a sustained basis, you have to develop a crop rotation. You also have to teach the farmer how to pronounce the word. That was one thing I learned, is I never suggest plants that the farmer can't pronounce because the right away they're hesitant. And then associated with that is, well, how do we grow this, Gary? How much fertilizer? And I always try to tell them, I go, you're the farmer. There's no law here. You can do whatever you want as long as you have water and, of course, as long as you're not producing drainage water. But you do what you want with this plant. I'll give you some basic guidelines. And this is what you can do with the plant, and this is the potential value of growing a crop like this. So as I have finally come to the conclusion here, I just want to leave you with this concept of heavy metals, can be in the soil, but you really have to look at the complete picture. And for me, Chernobyl taught me that I can use plants also as a tool for a toolbox, that we can use them to manage certain trace elements in the soil. 
with the wetland system or with the dry cropping system. Because the way that the TE or the heavy metal eventually lands in the human is this food chain transfer, soils to plants to humans. But you have to really understand before calling a soil or water contaminated, you know, how is the trace element entering the plant? And once we know the pathway of how it enters the plant, then we can determine whether there's any fertilizer strategy that we can employ, or do we grow a different plant? Do we grow a plant that has a low requirement of phosphate, even though the soil is high in arsenic, but if it has a low phosphate content, then it will accumulate a lower concentration of arsenic. So knowing what's in the soil will help us also determine what to grow. And lastly, I hope I've shown you that a plant can take up something it doesn't need, and a plant can also not take up. And so we have to understand what's taking place with the plant when it's grown at a particular contaminated site. Finally to the end. But it's a lot, and uh, it's a lot knowing the complete picture. So I hope I've given you a, a glimpse of my world and why I would never tell anyone this is what you should do because there's just too many other factors that you have to look at. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead and if you might stay there, please. We'll open the floor for questions, comments. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, to the panel. We'll start here in the room. And uh, obviously, uh, folks on the phone, uh, please, uh, you may want to unmute yourself if you're going to want to join in with the questions and comments. I see Gabrielle's got her, her uh, table tent up, so we'll go to Gabrielle first. Hey, Gary, thank you for a very interesting presentation. And um, A couple of things. One is, for this audience, can I ask you to go back to one of your slides where you just have the diagram of uptake? Because I just want to go over the really basics of what are the different mechanisms for uptake or exclusion. So you talked a lot about metals, which is mainly using some kind of transporter system to get across the cambium of or the, 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 the superized layer, if I'm remembering correctly. But I mean, the other big question for us is also the whole organic side and just trying to understand, you know, what are the different pathways for something to get into a plant. That's sort of my first, just a reminder of really basic 101s of that. Um, and then the other one is just simply, again, for the questions that we're dealing with, is we're dealing with traditional agronomic crops. Um, and so there the question then becomes, what do we know about them in terms of uptake, exclusion, if they exclude, where they exclude, um, these, some of these compounds. And I was just curious if there's any database for that, okay? But the first one is really sort of going back to, you know, how does water get in? What can go in with the water? What are the different pathways? What needs a transporter? So you need to have something that meshes. Just so we have an understanding of where might you have the problems and where not. Well, with your organic compounds, if those are not broken down, let's say we have some of these complex uh, large hydrocarbon type compounds, there's no way that the plant can take that up. But once any type of degradation takes place into byproducts, so for example with the poplar tree where I see this a lot in some of our diesel and, and gasoline contaminated soil sites, and the plant won't take that up, but after the poplar, it exudes these sugar-like molecules that attract and contribute to microbial communities, they will actually, the microbes will actually break that hydrocarbon down into, say, smaller hydrocarbons that the poplar tree can take up. And it will take that up, depending on how small it is, in the transpiration stream. And then that way it will be distributed to the plant and then will be sent to the vacuole. And again, I don't want to lump all hydrocarbons together as various different types. And uh, I concentrate mainly on inorganics. But, but the greatest bang for the buck with the poplars is their use in organically contaminated sites. And it's the number one plant that I recommend at some of the old military sites uh, on some of their contaminated soils. In regards to uptake into normal crops, 
Part of the work with the hyperaccumulators was twofold. It was to try and understand, did they possess some particular carrier or some particular transport system that allowed them to accumulate? And was that also present in some of our, let's say in, in tobacco, for example, where we have high concentrations of cadmium? So that was what I was initially, why I even went to the area of hyperaccumulators, and then I started concentrating more on the, vi on the phytomanagement. But in our normal crops, again, you have to ask yourself, first of all, which metal are we talking about in the inorganic world? And, you know, and it will enter. I mean, the arsenate will enter the phosphate, and, I mean, that's, that's known. It, just, it will fit in that particular carrier and be transported up. So we have to see, and I'm not, um, you know, I'm not uh, with the USDA and, you know, on my field sites, you know, I still have to think very macro. And I, I just don't have the time to be doing uh, carrier work, you know, on, on small root systems in the laboratory. It, yeah, but others have, but they, but they have to look at it in the real world. I mean, because... You look at those type of scenarios in a clean laboratory world, and what you see there is not what you see, uh, you know, in our real soils because, you know, we have so many other real factors. And that's, that's part of the, the major problem with science in trying to solve or manage this area with, with the heavy metals is you have those folks that look at it in an isolated laboratory, and then you have someone like me who's looking at it in a macro perspective that understands that there's many factors, but I need to work with the, the other people in order to understand, you know, what, what is taking place. And that's why with plants, you know, I find a better working relationship with other countries than with the United States, uh, with scientists here. So funding, publication, I mean, you know, the whole normal thing there. And also, I'm not sure, I mean, this, when Carl told me about the interest that you had in the heavy metal, you know, I was excited to finally hear about, you know, there was some interest in this because uh, I had never heard of there being an interest. And then I thought, well, maybe there's no interest because when I used to do all my biosolid work, I couldn't find any heavy metals in the biosolids. So I couldn't find dirty uh, treated biosolids to even look at heavy metal content because we were so clean with the type of industries that we have here. But I always knew cadmium was located in the Salinas Valley. I worked with the cadmium specialist, the Rufus Cheney, back east, the guru, and he told me, and I went down in Salinas and did sampling, and sure enough, I found high cadmium. <clears throat> so I was happy when Carl finally told me. So there isn't a lot of, when you ask for a database, there isn't a large database. I mean, they have casually looked at other content, and I only looked at it because I was growing vegetables, and I was concerned, you know, what else is in the plant material. Bruce? And oh, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah. sir. You are. I'm sorry, Gary. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. And we've been rather lucky here in Central California because we're protected by our high pHs, and uh, so you know the low pH is where you definitely have to have big concern. But we we're protected. In that regard, Bruce. Bruce, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, you you sort of touched on some of the things and maybe don't actually have the answer for that. But as you, two of the crops that we're concerned with are almonds and the citrus, <coughs> and we're concerned with the fruit. And it, the indicator you, from what you said before was that metals didn't tend to go into the fruit or seeds; that they would go into the leaves and and cause senescence. I've seen that in my own work, so I'm kind of familiar with that. And we hadn't seen anything going into the fruit. But I wanted to find out what you, for you to elaborate on that. What did you know about the transport, the translocation, movement of through the xylem, and, you know, the partitioning and such like that in general? And if you knew anything specifically about almonds and citrus? Well, it's interesting you asked that, Bruce. I've just, I've just received funding, and I'm... Uh, I now learned how to spell the word pistachio. And uh, it's a great interest, especially when you see, you know, we're 300,000 plus here in California of uh, nut-producing pistachios now. And um, 
you know, and they're grown in some pretty poor quality type soils and or irrigated with poor quality waters. So I'm, that's one of my areas now is looking at the effect on <coughs> nut quality and what's actually accumulating uh, in the nut it itself. And so the plant will do, and the other thing that you have to mention, that I have to mention with nuts and with trees, with our perennial crops, is we have a lot of storage sites. We have the wood itself. And before that gets into the nut, to the fruit, you know, you have to oversaturate uh, those storage location sites in the tree itself before it will actually start accumulating in the, <coughs> the nut or the fruit. And in the fruit world, you know, um, a lot of our fruits are grown on the east side. And uh, I tend to hang out on the west side. Complete two different soils. You know, we have our granitic type sandy loam soils originating from the Sierra Nevadas. That that's pretty clean soil compared to our uh, uh, sediment based uh, heavy clay like salty soils on the west side of California. So in the fruit world, you know, I'm I haven't investigated uh, citrus at, at all. Uh, so I don't know about citrus, but from my encounters with others um, and also in China, there has been accumulation of heavy metals in, uh, in their fruits, in nectarines, plums, in apples. And again, that was arsenic uh, in, their, in their fruits in, in China. And they're irrigating their plant, their trees with arsenic contaminated water and you know who knows for how many years that's taken place so I could easily understand it's been something that's been passed traditionally for many years and it's exceeded the plant's ability to safely store uh, arsenic for example in China. Okay I want to go to uh, our uh, panel members on the phone. I Before I do that just my point of order I just heard a beep um, and I had heard one uh, during the presentation, I think, so I'm just going to check in. I know that we've got, from the panelists, we've got Dave Mazzara, uh, Ken, and Barbara. Did somebody or any other persons join us on the phone? Is anybody else on the phone? Hi, yes. Um, this is Stephanie Hung. I'm from PSC Healthy Energy. Okay. Um, and is anybody else on the phone? The other, this is Barbara, the other ping you heard was I accidentally disconnected you okay. and had to get back on. All right. Thank you, Barbara. Um, let me check in actually with Dave and Ken and Barbara. Do you have any comments or questions that you'd like to make at this time? I do not. Okay. Uh, checking back in to the room. Are there any uh, other questions or comments that panelists would like to make or staff? Okay. Uh, I see Dr. Stringfellow as our science advisor. Let me go to Bruce and then I'll go to Dr. Stringfellow and then We'll uh, go ahead and I'll check in to see if there's any emails on this particular topic, and then I'll open up the floor to the public. So we'll go to Bruce and then Dr. Stringfellow. Go ahead. Um, one of the things you mentioned was the, one of the oh. things you mentioned was the protective nature of the high pH soil, and uh, there was this recent article just a couple of days ago from s some researchers at Stanford having to do with chromium, and the notion that if you uh, amended those soils with organic material or fertilizers, nitrate and phosphorus, um, you had a tendency to cause the um, metals, in this case chromium, to switch from, from trivalent to hexavalent and became, become bio or available. I don't know how bioavailable, but at least available. Um, any thoughts on that? Have you seen that in what you've been working on that those soils, if they're actually used in agriculture, can uh, morph or change over time? Oh, ab absolutely, and absolutely. And, uh, and again, that's what makes it also a little bit complicated. Despite having the high pH soils, I mean, the growers are working those soils. The, gr the growers are adding input. You know, we're getting this oxidation reduction. You know, the soil chemistry is changes. And that definitely can affect the speciation of some of these... Uh, the metals. So I, you know, it's, it's a dynamic type system. And uh, once you determine that you have a, t a high concentration of a, a, a high total concentration of a particular metal, now it's time to take an active role as to what am I doing or what am I not doing 
that's affecting or can affect the solubility and the bioavailability of that trace element. I mean, it goes to a different level. And that'll be site specific. Uh, you know, that'll also be determined by what type of crop species is planted there. Of course, the soil type, um, you know, your agronomic management that takes place there. And those all influence the soil chemistry and, and speciation changes. But definitely, I would. But for chromate, especially, um, you know, I, I haven't uh, worked specifically with, with CR, but I definitely would concur with that, with that thought. Okay, thank you, Bruce. Uh, Will, we'll go to you. <clears throat> Hi, Bruce, thanks for the talk. Um, thanks for the talk, Gary. Um, I have been trying to, these questions a little bit been touched on, but I'm trying to clarify it so that we have clear guidance on a few couple of questions. And one of them is, can you say just definitively that fruit would be the last or the unlikely location for accumulation to occur? So that, you know, going to two questions, which is partly experimental design, but also just in terms of public safety, fruit's the last stop for these kinds of materials. Is that true or false? I would, you know, I would, I can't speak for all fruit, but I, from my experience, I would concur with that thought. It's okay. going to be last on the loading zone as okay. to where it would go. Good. And, um, uh, and then one reason for that also is fruit do not transpire. They transpire at the very early stages. So anything um, that, that enters the fruit as the fruit is maturing it comes from another transport system called the phloem. <clears throat> and the phloem is where our sugars and our carbohydrates are, and they start supplying the fruit. I haven't, just in my experience, when I've examined uh, xylem and phloem for heavy metals, I haven't detected them in the phloem in a form that could be transported to the fruit. Okay. But again, uh, I don't have multi-year experience with fruits. Uh, you know, it just hasn't been one that I've looked at. Okay, and then the but a good, but it's a good point. Okay, yeah. then the um, second point to clarify, which I think you referred to a little bit in some of the questions, is do we know clearly which fruit crops are so-called indicators versus excluders? Because you remember the accumulation pattern with an indicator, it's somewhat, well, it's for the sake of argument, call it equilibrium with the environment. Mm -hmm. But the, the excluder, it's going to be less than the environmental concentration. Then all of a sudden, it's going to reach some threshold value. So is there a body of work that says in terms of food crops, whether they are indicator types versus excluders? No, good could... question. No. Okay. There, there isn't, yeah. And, you know, usually with those bioindicator plants, they will be grown in, they'll be growing in areas that are already heavy metal contaminator. Hence the reason why it's an indicator. It's indicating to us that a particular metal is in that soil just by the pure existence okay. that that plant is growing there. <clears throat> okay, any uh, questions from staff before I go to the public? Okay, I'm gonna open up the floor for the general, sorry, I'm gonna turn myself around here. General public. Um, I'll double check to make sure the microphone is on, and you can just go ahead and approach the mic and uh, ask questions. I'm Bill Alio with Environmental Working Group. We've been following this issue for a couple years now. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I would note that. Um, in the general media, Consumer Reports has, re, has warned us against eating too much rice because it has arsenic, and a lot of that is produced in Northern California. The source I heard from a grower was using chicken manure because they feed arsenic in the chickens to make them grow faster and ended up in the manure, which ended up in the rice. But there's also naturally occurring arsenic in our groundwater. So uh, that's the case. I, as a consumer, I worry about that. Um, and as a just a layperson consumer with a little science background, the issue we're dealing with here in Kern County, <clears throat> excuse me, I thought just logically, what are the odds or the science that will allow uptake through an almond tree all the way to this little nut or a pistachio? I said, it's probably not likely. 
But the big question has been, what about uh, carrots or onions or potatoes grown directly in the soil? And it seems to me that's the one that's a more critical question than whether an almond, even though it takes a lot of water to grow that almond, would end up with cadmium or some of the other th chemicals that are in the, um, the, the uh, train of things coming down into the water district's uh, canals. So that's, I guess, a question. Uh, if it's a, in the form of a question, what about things that are actually grown in the soil, not just in the plant uh, tree above ground? Uh, absolutely. Um, and that's why I mentioned that once you know what type of contaminant that you do have in the soil, that should determine what type of plant that you will be growing in that type of soil. And exactly, I would not be growing any tubers, carrots, sugar beets, onions, garlic, uh, in a soil that I knew had heavy metals in the soil just because of the uh, absorption and adsorption that may be taking place. Yeah, so you wouldn't do that, but you're not a farmer or a regulator. Um, and then also, chemicals used in the oil production process aren't naturally occurring for the most part. They may replicate things that are naturally <coughs> occurring, like lead or something, but there are a lot of other chemicals used up there, 100, 100 or more. Um, have you ever studied uh, or found plants that are uptaking chemicals that weren't naturally occurring? So a mining waste or natural occurring in the soil is one thing, but you found, oh, an industrial use of this odd thing, dihexyl, whatever. How is it getting in this plant? It's obvious from this industrial process that it likely was. Have you found that? Uh, what I briefly touched upon during the talk was the use of the poplar tree. And the poplar tree attracts such a diverse microflora that those microflora that are only associated with poplar have the ability to break down those large hydrocarbon complexes into edible forms, which can be taken up and stored in the poplar tree. So with the use of trees and the microflora, that can take place. Now, are they able to do it for all of these synthetically produced organic compounds, and how much time does that take? That I don't know. But it is a process that does take place. Right, and there's, they're obviously inorganic, synthetically produced or inorganic compounds, but, but they may be made up of things that could be naturally occurring that are combined to end up in the water. Yeah, and I'm talking about the synthetically produced hydrocarbons, the ones that are not natural occurring. The microflora that's associated with the poplars is able to break those down into byproducts, and depending on what the byproduct, whether it's byproduct one or byproduct two, those can be taken up by the poplar tree stored in the wood, and then the trees removed with the uh, byproducts. And I noticed in your presentation you had a lot of you know, just leafy, flowery plants, not a big tree, this woody, hard stem. But uh, is it, did you, have you found that um, a, a plant that is more water, filled with water, is more likely to accumulate chemicals, uh, excuse me, trace elements or metals than a woody, large plant like a tree? versus the, the low growing, like you had sandwort, for example, a dune plant, mm -hmm. um, which has, I know, water, and I've worked in that area a little bit. What do you think about that? You know, the, um, when I, I use those plants as bioindicator plants, whenever I see those in different parts of the world being grown, then I already suspect we have a heavy contaminated hot spot in this particular area because I see that plant surviving there. As far as using those for management tools here in the United States, I, I do not use them. And whether there's an association with the water content of those plants compared to a woody type plant material, you know, it, it really all depends. I haven't found trees except for this one tree, the nickel accumulator in Caledonia. I don't find perennial crops that possess that ability to hyperaccumulate. I've only seen it with plants. Interesting, so perennials. Like, a, like celery, which is primarily water, is uh, grown over and over and over in the same soil. You're saying maybe that wouldn't be able to uptake um, in the Salinas Valley a naturally occurring trace metal because it doesn't have time, or, and even though it's really watery? You know, it would depend on the pH of that soil. Even if the cadmium is in the soil, which it is in the Salinas Valley, that one reason that the, the vegetables 
are not accumulating, not all of vegetables are accumulating in excessively high concentrations, is the pH is still above seven. If that was ever to be in an area, a very sandy soil or a low pH soil, there you would have the accumulation of the cadmium. So you have to look at the soil properties I also. Have I mean, to. So the west side of the San Joaquin Valley is generally alkaline? Yes. And the east side is generally what? Well, it's, it's, you know, it's two different soils, you know, completely two different worlds. And uh, so our soils on the east side I, I find anywhere from uh, six eight to seven two, on the west side. You know, we're looking at an eight four up to eight eight. Uh, so it's a complete different breed. Right. So the west east side isn't necessarily acidic. No. It's but it's lower but pH. It's lower pH okay. than the west side. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Any other questions in the room, David? Um, my name is David on Sullivan here, Coala Water District. Um, the state has maximum contaminant levels for drinking water, and the water that we utilize is produced water. The metals are about half of their maximum contaminant level. Is there a concern of the buildup in the soil? David, I don't think they can hear you, Nate. Oh. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, okay. Um, the state has maximum contaminant levels for drinking water. And the water we use has about half of those uh, for the metals. Uh, or excuse me, the metal levels are about half the maximum contaminant level. Is there any concern of those building up in the soil at that low of a rate? If there's use of continued use of using the produce waters, mm -hmm. yes, I, I would say that you have to always take, if we're using poorer quality water, um, you have to look at the buildup, the movement, lateral, vertical move, uh, movement of those particular compounds. And that would be something that I would, uh, I would definitely watch. And even when I advocate the use of poor quality waters, you know, I do it a little bit differently. I do it like a checkerboard. So one year I'll be here, the next year I'll be here, and I move around, assuming I have that much land to work with, but I have over 680 acres. So I would, and one of the reasons was that very reason, because if I was to use the same site with this poor quality water, we're gonna get this accumulation over time. So I may have removed some constituents, but I may have destroyed the soil with other constituents because of the accumulation. But if the, me, if the water is below drinking water standards, that would still be considered a poor quality water for irrigation? Well, it, you know, depend if you're looking at it on a sustained use, on continued use of it, it all requires, when we use these type of waters, it requires a new way of thinking. It's not, uh, you know, traditional farming now. Now we're looking at using poor quality water on a sustained basis and manage the quality of the soil. So now it requires a new thinking. It's something that's be new for the farmer. They don't know this. You know, it's a... Uh, cheaper source of water for them and you know they can't see you know what also is being applied but I know and so there has to be monitoring that's that's taking place in regards to soil sampling and groundwater quality and what's accumulating in the particular plant thank you yeah okay any other questions in the room okay we had uh, Stephanie on on the phone from PSC. I don't know whether you were uh, just listening in or you had had a question that you had emailed in or so I'm just going to check in with you because we don't normally have somebody else calling in on the phone. But um, uh, Stephanie, are you still there? Yes, I'm still here. Okay. Do, were you just listening in or did you have a question that you wanted to pose? Or? Um, I'm just listening for now. Yes, thank okay. you. All right, thank you. Okay, let me check in with Rebecca. Any um, email comments? Okay. Uh, hearing none, seeing none. I'll go to the panel one last time, first in the room, then on the phone. Any last comments or questions from the panel? I guess I may as well ask. You probably looked at the water quality for from the produced water. Is there anything that you'd see from the inorganic perspective that would cause you interest? You know, I'm very interested in that arena. You know, I've been approached a couple times, but to be honest with you, 
all I've seen is, is data of other people performing the analyses. So I myself have not uh, experienced produce waters. I mean, you, you <laughs> so are you saying that the numbers for the levels of the inorganics are not numbers that you would trust because you didn't do them yourself? No, no, I'm not saying that. It's just <laughs> saying that I myself haven't actively analyzed those type of waters. And, uh, okay. well, so, so all you I asked, wanted was to see whether there was anything, if you had looked at the, what the list of everything that folks have looked for, yeah. if there was anything that suddenly, oh, yeah, God, we've got to be worried about zinc or something like that, any of those that particularly caught your attention. Well, Bruce, the way I look at real research is when I receive a snapshot of data, to me, it's only a snapshot. I have to know how frequently, how long, how was the sampling, how did the sampling even take place. You know, I ask myself many questions before I start getting concerned. I mean, it's a list. I don't work with the waters. You know, I've only looked at the data because it's been brought up for various research projects down in Kern County. but. It isn't something where I've actually had, where I've been actively participating in. So I don't feel that I'm qualified to elaborate until I myself have more information about how that data was accumulated and how long it's been accumulated. Okay. I seem perplexed, but uh, I haven't worked with those waters, Bruce. Okay, I'm going to go to staff and leadership. Any comments or questions? All right. Hearing and seeing none. We are at 11.49. I'm going to suggest that this is as reasonable time as any to go ahead and move on to the lunch break since we have a um, full remaining agenda for several other items. So um, just for purposes of safety in terms of the schedule, um, is anybody opposed to trying to aim for a 45 minute lunch or do you all find that it really given where we are located here physically that we really need a an hour <laughs> hour it is then okay <laughs> all right so we Rebecca, can you uh, can you send us an email so we know when to get back on yes yeah, well, I, we're going to aim. I mean, we'll go ahead and do that, Barbara, but uh, we're at 11.50 right now, so I'm going to just say we, we will reconvene at 12.50. Huh? Okay. I'm Good, gonna, thanks. I'm every minute I can. <laughs> um, we're going to go ahead and reconvene at 12.50, and um, folks that are on the phone, you can call back in at that time if you choose, or you can keep your line open and just mute yourself and however you want to handle it, folks in the room. Okay, if I could have uh, panel members that are in the room uh, go ahead and get themselves seated, please, so we can go ahead and get started. And also, uh, GSI Environmental, if you guys can be kind of queued up to be uh, ready to go, that'd be great.
Okay, let's uh, go ahead and check in. Uh, I think we have the full cadre of uh, repeat customer panelists. <laughs> um, thanks for coming back, guys. <laughs> um, is it hot out there, by the way? I imagine it is. Yes. Okay. Just a, okay. No, no small mammals were exploding spontaneously when you were going along. <laughs> All right, and then on the phone, we've got Dave and Ken. Barbara, do we have you back yet? Are you muted, Barbara? All right, well, we're going to go ahead and proceed anyway. I've been told, okay, we got Clay and we got Dr. Longley. So we are going to proceed now on to agenda item four, uh, and that's going to be um, from uh, Dr. Rob Schofield and uh, Bernie Beckerman uh, from GSI. Uh, the presentation is already pulled up, so we're going to go ahead and go through their items, uh, see if there's anything that uh, we need to touch on a little further from the bullets that are on the agenda. Otherwise, we'll open up the floor as usual, panel Q&A, and then public Q&A. Uh, Rebecca, at this time, actually, before we go do that, did we, we did have a one general comment email? Uh, yes, correct. Okay, why don't we go ahead and read that into the record right now, just before we start. It, unless it is like particularly voluminous. Barbara, is that you? Yes. Okay, great. All right, so we're just getting started. Um, we're just gonna quickly read into the record an email comment that had been sent in. I think it's a general email comment and then, so Rebecca's gonna read that and then we'll, we're gonna move on to agenda item four. So go ahead, Rebecca. This email comes from Ravi Bhatia of Trihydro Corporation, and her email reads, uh, Good morning. My coworker forwarded the food safety panel information to me. My practice area is an air quality regulation, which sometimes includes agricultural, food, and beverage industries. I was curious to learn if an air quality practitioner or air district panel member might be added or if more volatile air toxics might be added to develop thresholds below which they might be excluded. Thank okay. you. Great, very good. So we'll have that as a note and we can identify this as an action item for regional board to respond to should they need to. All right, with that, uh, we're gonna go ahead and I'm gonna hand it over to, to GSI. So Rob, are you gonna lead us off? Um, not sure. All right, that looks better. Um, so since last time, it sounds better. Since last time I was here, we actually now have all of our contract. We had three tasks, you might recall. We've got all of those in place now, and we are working on all three of them. Uh, I don't have a lot of results to report from them, but we are, we are starting on them. Um, and uh, oh, um, I should have brought my stronger glasses. Um, <laughs> so, so the so the yeah, it should be on your screen right there too. So, oh, okay, that works. So <laughs> the um, so the scope of work is pretty much what what was what was given to us. We made really minor modifications to it, and the modifications were in the form of adding a little bit of detail about how we would do some of the things that we were, we were asked to do. So I'll talk about that and then I'll introduce you to my colleague Bernie Beckerman who will give you a little bit of uh, what we've done with the, uh, with the expanded list of uh, oil, oil producing chemicals that we've, that we've uh, analyzed so far. So task one is to identify the chemicals of interest and uh, we had some discussions at the last meetings with Will Stringfellow and we, we realize he's already done a fair amount of that, partly for other projects and partly for this project, and so we're gonna share, build on what he's already got, and we're gonna really be adding the toxicology component to it, and some of the fate and transport of, well, which, which chemicals are used are actually likely to make it to the fruit, so the discussion this morning was very interesting to me for, because we were asking questions along those lines of, well, how, how likely is it to actually get into a root crop or a nut or a fruit. So 
we'll be going through that thinking process. Um, and then we, <clears throat> we decided, since this does need to be open and public and, and uh, transparent, we're going to basically follow and be stimulated by or be motivated by the contaminant, uh, contamin the contaminant candidate list, CCL list that EPA uses to identify drinking water standards. So we'll go through a very similar kind of thinking process of, okay, what are the chemicals that need to be considered overall, which ones are likely to be toxic, which ones are likely to be present at levels that might be of concern, and then as, as a really a judgment process at the end, then pick the ones that we really think need to be monitored for. So it'll be, it'll be very transparent, um, stepwise, systematic. There will definitely be judgment involved and we'll have you know, multiple people on our, on our company looking at it but then we obviously run it by the water board, run it by the panel, so that there's a consensus before we <coughs> finalize that list. Um, all right, then the, um, I, I guess, okay. So I, I, I kind of combined those two bullets, but so, so the idea there is to just have a very transparent, systematic process. Then for the literature review, we're going to look look more into some of the toxicity information and what's the, uh, so we can uh, understand what is the exposure limit we're worried about for some chemicals and we can calculate the detection limits we would want, kind of back calculate detection limits we would want. So what we're going to look into, well, what's the consumption level of each of these crops that we're interested in to make sure we've got an adequate detection limit. And we're going to use be inspired by a process <coughs> that was developed by this Cochrane Institute in England, which is the organization that develops these evidence-based uh, procedures for medical medical procedures. So, and, and the same thing, it's, it's just a systematic way to say, okay, what is my question that I'm specifically trying to answer? What data is relevant to that, to that question? And then we go through and look at which data we're going to use and then show that data and say, okay, this is our basis for setting an exposure limit for this chemical. And it'll involve judgment, <clears throat> but it'll be a very systematic and transparent laid out process following, following this Cochrane procedure. You may or may not be familiar with it. It's, it's not a systematic, you know, check the boxes process. There's still judgment involved, but it's definitely open and you document it. And then, then the third is the sampling of the crops, which we've, we've uh, done that. Or we're monitoring that, looking at the results. We just got back the results from the citrus. We haven't had a chance to look at them all yet, <coughs> but we're in the process of looking at what are the levels that were detected and uh, talking to the labs about that, and we'll have a summary of that data pretty soon. Um, all right, so then we, we also received from the water board the list of uh, additives that, that were provided by the oil companies, and we've gone through that and done a preliminary selection of what additional chemicals should be done right away, and then we're, we're going to go through and look at more systematically, I mean, I'll let, I'll let Bernie talk about those results, but we're going to go through them more systematically as part of this task one. Um, so let me introduce uh, Bernie Beckerman, who is a PhD from, toxic from, I guess, in toxicology from Berkeley, and who I introduced last time, but he wasn't actually here, and he was pals with Seth. Seth mentioned, oh, I knew him from grad school. So I'll let Bernie talk about the expanded list of analyzes and where we are with that. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, I guess in June, um, we got an expanded list of analytes, which I believe are now currently up on the Water Board website. <clears throat> and GSI was asked to review the list and um, determine whether or not there were any chemicals that are not currently being analyzed in the samples, in the crop samples that are being collected right now, that we believed should be added to that list. Um, and we sort of saw this as a low-hanging fruit problem. You're like, were there some subset of the 305 that are not being sampled that we really believe there is evidence to suggest that it would be good to get an idea of whether or not they're present 
um, and at levels that are of any concern. And so from that 300 and list of 305, um, we, uh, we reviewed the key toxicologic literature to determine whether chemicals had high oral toxicity, whether there were health relevant doses in line with the magnitude that you might expect in contaminants found in crops, and whether or not the health effects were related to chronic exposures, because we didn't really believe that we were gonna find any exposures that were gonna cause acute effects. I mean, most of these crops have relatively low uh, uptake in comparison to levels that are associated with the acute effects. And so to do this, we basically broke up the list of 305 into what we'll call four different buckets. The first was we found, we determined which ones were already being analyzed for. And the, out of the 305, we only had 14. Um, and then there are those chemicals that were not of any concern or didn't seem of any plausible concern. These things include things like walnut shells, water, uh, crystalline silica, uh, wood dust, xanthan gum. And then this is where we come to the issue of like, we found five chemicals which we believed had some evidence to suggest that they should be tested. And this is bis-2-chloroethyl ether, benzyl chloride, 2-naphthalene, cyclohexyl amine, and acrylamide. Um, and for various reasons, uh, Benzyl chloride was a probable carcinogen under IARC. Uh, Two-naphthyl amine is a known carcinogen um, regulated under Prop 65 and also identified under, uh, identified under IARC. And the others are uh, sort of similarly classified with levels ranging of exposure associated with uh, outcomes of sort of in the microgram to, to partial milligram per kilo body weight. And then this last group is where the remainder of the chemicals that we're tasked with looking at for tasks one and two come in, and these are the ones that need further determination. And we're gonna be looking at both what they are, how they're, um, whether we see them in produced water um, and going through that, that CCL list process. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, so this is almost like a time critical thing where you've identified this this one subset in place of the CCL process. Yes. Yeah. It, well, this was a because there was sampling currently happening right now. Um, and we couldn't go through the full process of extracting all of the toxicologic data, doing a thorough review, determining whether or not these are gonna be uptaken by plants and then pose a potential risk for consumption. We identified under some very limited criteria like high toxicity through oral, cons through a, a oral exposure pathway um, and chronic exposures. Uh, Did you also consider, because I, mean, I know there's some information on each of these chemicals, the either mass or concentration that's um, used in the first place to figure out whether there would even be detectable levels, no matter what, what those levels might be uh, at, at the place where the crops would get. Th that information was not factored into this. Okay, so strictly I, I mean, it's there it, it, it's so Yeah, strictly those three. I mean, as part of the, the larger analysis for tasks one and two, that's gonna be factored in. But because it's not entirely clear right now, given the limited amount of time we had to review uh, this rather lengthy list of, of additives. And I'm assuming there's analytical <coughs> methods for each one we of these. Are, we have um, contacted the lab and we're working with them on that. Okay, all right. Okay, um, I know Will has a question. I just want to check in quickly yeah. with the panel. It was more, it was more a comment about oh, the comment. mass. Okay, go ahead. So that mass information has not been provided and it wasn't requested. But we do, we have seen that. I mean, like a year or two ago. That was I, on. I'm losing track of time on this whole uh, yeah, process. Yeah, that was but, uh, different. It was a while back we did get something. 
I, mean, I, I put, I put yeah, together I, I put together a spreadsheet that had that information that we had received from this yeah, area. Mark, I think most of that is fairly limited in scope that we had that information for. Part of the issue we ran into is that if we start talking about masses being used, we started delving into the world of trade secrets and not being able to divulge that information because it starts to get down to um, what's the recipe for specific compounds and could it be derived if you said in this area we had this kind of mass of this and this with that, that could that be reverse engineered to, um, to somehow divulge a trade secret that you know, we didn't take that route because we wanted to be able to be transparent with what we gave. And also, since GSI is not a sister agency and we couldn't get a confidentiality agreement, not only could I not divulge that information to the public, I couldn't even divulge it to GSI. So that's part of the reason why we're, we're down the path we're in, um, where we took the approach that said, okay, if it's there, it's potential. We need to know what it's there while the mass might help us to say that if we're using um, one milligram in, in the Kern River oil field, you know, it, it's nothing compared to if we're using 10,000 barrels. And I see that as potentially being uh, a problem because that could become important, especially if you're going to get into – um, some of the allies, you, you've identified it. It could be an issue, um, but there are no analytical procedures for it. So that would be another weight of evidence as whether you even need to go that route or not. And I think that would be one of the questions that if that became a very critical issue, um, then, you know, working with GSI, the panel, and, and Will Stringfellow, um, you know, to see how we tackle that and can we answer that question outside of the trade secret realm. Okay, uh, Bruce. Yeah, you had talked about <clears throat> using the contaminant candidate list kind of paradigm for this. Mm -hmm. and, and when I was looking at it, I was thinking, well, that's true to a degree, but I wanted to make sure that folks did understand that it really isn't. <laughs> it isn't completely like that. The way we EPA puts together the contaminant candidate list, that's kind of a wish list of things that people could potentially worry about. And there's uh, scientific elements that go into it, uh, toxicological elements. People say, well, we know that this is, is a toxicant and it is in water, and those get on. But there's also kind of the flavor of the month things that get onto that list. And the 110 or 112 that are on the list, many of them were put on by um, uh, folks, folks in the community that just said that they thought that this is a problem and we should take a look at it. So that's the list. What we actually do from that list is more like what you were talking about. We call it a regulatory determination. It's a separate activity where we actually go and first off take a look at the list and see what do we know toxicologically? Do we know anything about it or is this just somebody who's worried about something for some reason? And if we do know it to be a, a potential uh, problem, can we do any dose response on it? And that's usually the sticking point there that maybe you know it's an issue, but you have no idea whether it's an issue at high levels or low levels. The estrogens are a good example. I mean, we do know that they have impacts as birth control pills at high level, but at parts per billion, um, we don't know anything. So, so we pass on those things. But then we also don't go forward unless we actually know that it occurs in drinking water. And that's an issue of, as was already just said, do you have a method to even detect it? If you don't have a method to detect it, well, then if we don't know, then uh, we can't go anywhere with it. And that deals a lot with uh, the particularly organics of concern where we're worried about something that we don't know about. It could potentially be a problem, but we really don't know that it's a problem. And, and those we, don't, we can't deal with, only the things that we can quantify and go forward with. So you actually have to have the, the risk assessment and the occurrence, and it's got to occur at a level 
where <laughs> when you match the risk and <laughs> the occurrence, will actually yield the health impact, which is perhaps a fair way to go, but I don't know 100% that that's where this group wants to go because there's a consideration of things that uh, maybe we can't quantify at this point or we don't have adequate health information. So all I wanted to do was to say, okay, contaminant candidate list, regulatory determination, how EPA sets regs for drinking water, and that might not be 100% what you want to be thinking about here. I mean, I think just to, to get to your, your point, I think the, this multi-criteria decision analysis approach will at least allow us to identify where those gaps are, and then we can either put those chemicals, identify those chemicals that are definitely of concern, mm -hmm. those chemicals which seem like they may be, and this is why they may be, but we don't have enough information to make a final determination, mm -hmm. and then those where there's either no information, in which case... Well, I'm, I'm not sure what to do yeah. with those, but... Yeah, no, no I, I'm not particularly criticizing what you did. Uh, no, I... I goes, but I just, just wanted to make sure that folks that weren't potentially familiar with the ins and outs of the contaminant yeah. candidate list and how we make decisions um, didn't go and read everything on EPA's website and say, ah, this is not what you're doing here. Yeah. And, and, and I didn't think well, that I, was I wasn't taking it as a criticism. I okay. just wanted okay. to clarify sure. what we had proposed, that's all. Yeah, and, and I, I probably... When I said the contaminant list, I, I was really referring more to the winnowing process. Like, okay, we've got this big list that everybody's developed and had their chance to put the put their say in and have this master list. And now what we're going to do is winnow that down, and we're going and we're going to go through that same kind of thinking process of well, what do we know about the toxicity of this? What do we know about the likely likelihood of being present at levels that really are going to be uh, signif health significance, and and then kind of the third. Well, can we do anything about it? Which is also, can we detect it? Do we have any toxicity information? And I suspect we're going to have a group of chemicals where we just don't really know, and we're going to have to put it out there and say, you know, we're just going to have to keep monitoring. You know, and how we respond will depend on kind of the gut reaction of well, how important is that? You know, is that in a class of chemicals that? Uh, you know, endocrine disruptor that we're really, we need to track it and watch it because we're worried about that class, or is it in a class that, well, that, that whole class of chemicals just isn't very toxic and we're, it's probably not per, worth putting a lot of effort into. But I think we're going to have some, some gaps when we, when we winnow it down, but <clears throat> our goal is then to identify what all those gaps are. So it's the winnowing process that I was trying to stress, not the development of the master list. So thanks for clarifying that. Let me check in on the phone with... Uh Dave, Ken, or Barbara, do uh, any of you all have questions or comments that you'd like to raise? And be check, be sure to check and make sure you're not muted right now, please. So Dave, Ken, Barbara, anything you would like to add or ask? Uh, no, no, comment, no comment here. This is Ken. Okay. I, I don't have a comment. All right. Nor does Dave Mazzara. All right. Great. Thank you very much. Let me check back in with the panel. Uh, any further questions or comments to GSI staff? Okay, hearing none and seeing none, we'll go ahead and open up the. F oh yes, Clay. I had a comment, so. Oh, fine. And and it's and it's <laughs> as much a question. Um, I know you haven't had much time to to look at this information, but what we would like to get, we actually are out sampling grapes and almonds today and tomorrow. Is that correct? So they're, they're actually out sampling today. So it becomes a, a critical issue for the analytical processes. So I would like to get the panel weigh in. And if you can't provide it today and you want to think about this a little bit within the next few days, if you have any objections or recommendations for how we deal with this, but my thought is to add these five additional constituents provided that we have analytical methods that the lab can deal with that we should add them to the constituents being tested in the fruit and we should also add them in very short order to the constituents that are being tested in the water um, 
you know, and we'll be looking at the rest of these because I want to make sure that our water testing is complete and, and fruitful and I'll probably, um, I'm assuming Patrick, who I have not told this to yet, <laughs> will be supportive if on his, on his behalf I update monitoring reporting programs for those people to require that as we have these new list of constituents that their water sampling that they do quarterly incorporates the new chemicals that can be analyzed for where we have constituents. So um, that will be done in short order. And if you have any comments, suggestions, recommendations, deviations from what GSI has proposed, I would very much like to hear those. Thank you. Uh, Clay, well, do, Clay does find out in very short order if I'm not supportive. Um, but I, I think generally speaking, we're, we're, we're speaking the same language with our outlook on that. I guess my one comment on that is adding these compounds to the water, the quarterly water sampling, um, almost doing like a beta test of that. I mean, it's, it seems to me um, you wouldn't necessarily make that a permanent fixture unless you thought you needed to. Well, certainly with the monitoring reporting program, you know, we would like to get it if there become technical reasons in the future for why that would need to be changed. Um, we certainly would do that. But, you know, I think at this point I would say that they should be a part of the um, analytical testing for the water that's being used for the foreseeable future until we get a body of evidence that, you know, indicates that either it's not a threat um, it has no potential to be present in the water um, or for some other reason it would not to be, you know, basically the cost of doing the analysis um, isn't a benefit compared to um, the value of the data. Um, and that would be part of the, the measurement we would use to help to assess that. Yes, Dr. Bin. So a question in relating to that then. If you could, for, for me and maybe the benefit of others, remind me of the water, quarterly water testing that they're required to do currently includes, like what's the framework that you're requiring them to test for? And then the other thing is if you add these five and what's the meaning of a detection? If they detect it and report it and we don't have a, we don't understand <coughs> the public health significance of it, what would that mean to the water board, to the discharger? Um, it's, the, it's the level of uncertainty of, of a finding that concerns me of just adding something to a list. Um, I guess part of the reason, and it goes back a little bit to the comment that, that Mark Jones asked earlier about, you know, do we have the masses that are being used? Um, I think an important thing that needs to be considered and, and you know, certainly will be considered, I, I assume, in the future as we look at some of this is that if we do not see it in the water, you know, and we, but we know that it's being used, then the probability that it could somehow end up in the produce, I believe, is greatly reduced. Part of the reason, you know, I think that we need to build a body of evidence is because we sample periodically. We don't do continuous sampling, and we need to get some data to understand what the variability and fluctuation of some of this is. So the more periodic samples we get, we start to understand the variability, you know, until we can comfortably and and confidently say that, you know, this chemical isn't going to be present unless something changes. And so I think that's really the goal that we're going for, particularly, um, you know, the difficulty with analysis is that if we don't find it in the water with, you know, in a number of samples, then the confidence that we have that even if it's very toxic, you know, on a particular problem, it's, it's likelihood that it would ever be a problem in the fruit or the nuts or the produce is greatly reduced 
then if we do actually see it in the water and all of a sudden it becomes more of a critical nature to, to take that additional step, at least that's the logic in my mind and I'm certainly open to um, suggestions if there's a better way to do this. But the thought is, is that let's get a com as complete a picture of the water as we can to help inform potential risks associated with the crops. And if I could add, add to that too, that um, these, are, these five that we've added are chemicals that we have toxin information on so we can evaluate the significance of them being present in the produce. Um, and we've asked the lab, can you analyze for these? And they said definitely for the four and there's one that they're looking into and letting us know. But I think, I think at least three of them are probably already included in the, in the list of chemicals they run. So I don't, I don't think we're stressing them. They're going uh, uh, to call us back on one of the amines. Um, and, and then one of the things that we've talked about relative to this list, it'll be part of the analysis going forward, is that like four of those, the, the, they wouldn't, they, well, one of those, acrylamide, can form in some of the fruit. I mean, it, it can be, or in the, particularly in the potatoes, it can, it can grow in, and it would be there even if it wasn't in the irrigation water. The others would not be. So if we detect some chemicals that form in the fruit that are naturally part of the produce, then we have to go back and think about, well, where did this come from? And so not finding it in the water would actually be a help to say, okay, we think this is, this is at levels the literature says you expect to see it in potatoes, raw potatoes. That's what we're seeing it in. We're not seeing it in the water, so we don't think it's coming in from the produced water. So we'll have to go through that thinking process. And, and if I could, um, the, so the cyclohexamine is the one that isn't, is a, yeah. a question mark? Yeah. Because I, th I think the other four are pretty routinely included, at least in the NPDES scans. So I, we, we, we know yeah. BIS2 and Benzyl and acrylamine. Yeah, well. I think those will come out if we just ask them to report them. I don't think it'll be a, an addition in the, yeah. in the analyte list. Stephen, any, does that respond effectively to your question? Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And I guess there's one part. So what are they required to test for quarterly now in terms of all these additives? What is it that they're required to test for and report currently? Just in uh, general terms. So in general terms, they're required to test for general minerals, which is what it sounds like. And if you want me to elaborate, yeah. let me know. Uh, volatile organic compounds uh, using... Uh, EPA method 8260B, I think. Uh, PAHs using the 8270SIM method. Um, and as far as the um, operators themselves can get uh, oil production and process chemicals and additives uh, that have sampling methodologies. Um, so, so, if there, so if there's a methodology for their additives, you're asking them to report, test yeah. and report. Okay. I believe these five chemicals, however, weren't currently or weren't previously on our list because we obtained those, these through the 13267 orders. Thank you. So I didn't hear SVOCs via 8270. They're not? Yeah. No, we are. We are. Okay. Because, uh, yeah, some of these would be there. Yeah, and I, I don't know what the number of chemicals are that are in those lists, but it's an extensive list of chemicals that they're already analyzing. And the PAH is just for anybody that doesn't know, or the polynuclear aromatic hydrocarbons. You won't be heard yeah, they, min, many of them do occur naturally in the oil. Let me check in again with folks on the phone. Uh, Dave, Ken, and Barbara, any uh, additional questions or additive to the question that Stephen had asked? Not for me. Okay. Not, nothing here. All right. Very good. Okay, I'm going to check in with panel and staff one last time uh, for any further questions to GSI staff. Otherwise, I'm going to then go to the public. All right, hearing none, seeing none. Rebecca, let me check in with you first. Do we have any emails that have come into this topic? Okay, so if we go ahead and read that into the record, and then we'll check in to folks here in the room. This email comes from Deb Workman. 
It reads, hello, question for GSI. What about chemicals that may result from the breakdown of additives, for example, in the soil? Thanks. She should have been with us at lunch, because that's what we were talking about. <laughs> um, um, and I, I think there are some of the, you know, we, what we talked about in particular were some of the ethoxylated alcohols that were in the, you know, the those are the larger organic chemicals that are in the in the, the list that we got, that 305. So we we're going to look to see, well, what, what might those break down to? And Will has some expertise in that, so we'll be consulting with him as well to see, well, do we think we're going to have any degradation products that we should be looking for separately from the whole the whole, the whole large organic that's put into the, that's put into the, uh, whatever the oil production use of it is. Okay. Bernie, was there anything you wanted to add to that? No. Yeah. All, right. All right. Let's uh, go ahead and open up the floor to uh, folks in the room. So same, um, same drill. Please uh, go ahead and approach the microphone. State your name and pose a question. And David, sorry, your mic's. Uh, my name is David Ansolabaher with Coelho Water District. Of the bucket one, uh, the 14 of the 305 chemicals, is that what we're testing for in the crops or the water? Uh, it's in the crops. Because um, we we're we doing an extensive analysis on the water, um, so you, you don't know how much of those 300 or 305 are being tested for in the water already. I do not. That's not, yeah. Yeah, this is specifically just for the crop sampling that was taking place. I, I want to go back just for a minute because Clay had posed the the question, um, and I just want to sort of you know close the loop on it. I I, I did not see any or hear. I mean, other than uh, Dr. Beam's question, for clarification, was there any opposition from the panel to to expand the 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 sample efforts to these five? I mean, that was essentially what you were asking for these upcoming sampling activities, right? Yeah, I, I would just like to have the panel's opinion of doing that and whether you think that's a good idea, you have an alternate idea, or, you know, since you haven't had a lot of time to think about this, certainly if you have thoughts in the next few days or, or a week, you know, we would certainly like to hear what those are so that we can incorporate those so that, you know, we're going down a path that, that is supported by the, the panel as well as as GSI and staff. So go ahead, Mark. Uh, I guess my one comment is that we've already identified that a couple of these, I can think of A and B in particular, are SVOCs that are usually covered under 8270. We probably have water data for those already. Um, so that would be something worth looking at. Yeah, that's definitely something we will be looking at. All right. Uh, not hearing or seeing any other feedback at this time, let's go ahead and just put this as a time a time certain action item. When do you need to hear one way or another from the panel by in order to accommodate the upcoming sampling? Well, let me ask uh, GSI or, or David and Solba here. How soon does a lab need to know, um, assuming that they're going to start receiving samples in the next couple days? If we're going to be testing for these five, then remind me, are, did we already test the root crops? Did we add these five to those? Have we added? I don't believe they had been added to the potatoes that were just analyzed. We added five additional. I'm just did curious, we? Are these the five? I, I do not believe they are the five. Okay. Um, I would think we need to get them. I mean, we're sampling today and tomorrow. I would say by Friday, or by the latest, we need to have the lab know that we want to sample for this or test for this. And, but I believe that, Rob, and you guys have asked the lab if they can do the analyses so they are aware that the request is, is probably coming. Yes, they are. So, the sooner the better. No, I, I agree with that. I just. I want to give the panel as much time as possible in case they have an epiphany, but um, at the same time, we need to make sure that it's done in the, you know, as quickly as can be done so that, um, 
we don't go and change something after or try to change something it's too late to do that all right so oh, yeah, gabrielle go ahead this week yeah i was going to say so yeah. let's, let's let's go, go by friday yeah so let's let's go by let's say 10 a.m friday i mean if you're if i think noon on friday noon? if we had right. it at noon on friday we'd be in good shape to make sure the lab um was aware okay i'm gonna i'm gonna suggest that um unless there's any concern from staff otherwise that when if, if panel members weigh in on this by by noon on friday um please include all the other panel members so all of the entire panel is sort of seeing any feedback that you're providing and then we'll i, I think given the the nature of this because it's it's not common that we ask the panel to weigh in and sort of an e-based dialogue i think we're going to want to make sure if there is any feedback make that a part of the public record of the project okay just so that because that that i mean this is not a Bagley Keen group, but nonetheless, for the period of spirit of transparency, let's do. That. No, I agree. We will we will keep those emails and all of the emails, and um, you know, we're just trying to make sure we get to the best result we can get to. Right. Okay. So noon on Friday. Yes, uh, I don't Stephen. need to wait till Friday. You can put my vote down, as I'm okay with these. <laughs> That way, that way, it's done, and I don't have to remember to okay. do it. Bruce, Bruce <laughs> has apparently had an epiphany. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just going to suggest, I know that you did describe, you know, Mark had a question about, you know, how how these were identified, but if there's something that could be given to us in writing in terms of, even if brief, you know, the criteria used to select these five um, based upon the toxicological literature. Well, I'm seeing uh, five, but it would be <coughs> nice to know, you know how you yeah, came we, up we with that. We problem. sent a draft of that over, maybe it got lost. We, we've got a short description of it. Dale, Dale, do you have? Have you seen the draft? Probably. Yeah. I, um, yeah I I'm sorry, that. I was looking up data on this two chloroform. We will forward that to the panel this afternoon. What, we'll, what are we forwarding? We'll, I saw it. I was that? Yeah, was yeah that, that was the, sent out to <laughs> was that Dale, the memo Clay, that and Will um, last week, last that, Friday. That was the longer memo. Not that was the longer memo. memo yeah, we, we can forward that right now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And then clearly we would want that to be part of the public record as well. So. All right. Um, any other public comment or questions? Seeing none and hearing none, we are going to move on to agenda item five, project update. And uh, let's see, Rebecca, I think you're going to take the lead on this with uh, back up from Clay, color commentary from Clay as need be. Yeah, <laughs> nice. yeah not, not, on, not on every item. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> All right. But we do, we, do you want me to go ahead and can you pull the, I don't think you can pull up the um, presentation from there, can you? From your well, monitor, are you going to come here? I just have uh, one slide for one of these items. Nonetheless. I, yeah. you know, so. You want me to go up there? I'm sure, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody in the web land and the interweb should see you. Okay. So um, on one of these items, I think Dr. Stringfellow is going to talk, but for the first two, I can talk a little bit. So you may need to open up. I'm not the, the presentation. Or is Jean doing that? Well, I saw the cursor moving. I only need the slide for one of these items. Okay, all right. We'll yeah. Slide up anyway, yeah, sure. go ahead. Okay. Um. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, <laughs> so I wanted to give a quick, quick update on the sampling efforts that um, Central Valley Water Board staff have uh, been undergoing this year. So as discussed in previous meetings, the board is overseeing a second round of sampling. Just like last year, this year, grapes, almonds, citrus, pistachios, and root crops will be sampled. Citrus was sampled in March, and we talked about that at the last meeting. 
Root crops were sampled in early July. Those were potatoes and, or I'm sorry, carrots and garlic. And um, grapes and almonds are being sampled today and tomorrow. And pistachios will be sampled sometime in the fall. Um, so, Dr. Stringfield, did you want to talk about the crop reports? We already covered um, the additive lists. Uh, well, you turn them on. The only thing I think really to say is that the uh, hopefully final crop reports have been posted on the website. Um, this, these reports that are posted, they're by uh, crop. They were, uh, the original uh, analysis has been, all the analysis has been presented here in two previous meetings, so there's nothing new in terms of analysis, uh, you know, in terms of data and results. The, uh, the reports that are on the site have been subject to review by the Food Safety Panel originally. There were comments given. Uh, those uh, comments and there was some additional analysis act, uh, uh, asked for. Those were done and particularly detailed in the Citrus Report. Then based on some of those, uh, you know, what the results of those analyses were, which is basically comparing different statistical techniques we set on the original uh, set of using parametric statistics and then went back and analyzed the rest of the uh, data from the 2017 sampling season. It went through another review after that from uh, some input from some of the food safety panel members but also a lot of input from the regional board and went back and forth with and you know both to uh, clarify some of the scientific questions but also just to clarify the uh, accessibility of the information to a more general audience. So there's a lot of rewriting along those lines. And then those reports are now hopefully done and posted. Um, there's a certain amount of repetitiveness. I'll uh, warn anybody who wants to read through them that there's, uh, uh, you know, we did follow kind of a uh, system for analyzing the data and so that there's a easily cross comparison against the different uh, crops and what we did. And I'll be glad to answer any specific comments that, or if people have comments on the reports that are as they're written. Um, those comments can be, uh, certainly if there's anything found that needs to be changed, we can uh, update the reports. But hopefully that's kind of the, the end of the data documentation for the first year. Yeah, and, the, and, and as stated, this has been subject for, for discussion at several meetings so I don't and it was an agenda item from the last or an action item from the last meeting and it's been completed so clay and I do just want to add that we'll have this as a, an agenda item for the next meeting also um, since they just got posted onto the website there may be people that that have questions or something that have not had a chance to review them yet we would have liked to have had them up a little sooner but we're not able to get that done so that you know we'll carry it on over and and if there are comments or questions that people want to have um, they can contact us beforehand or we'll we'll handle this at the next uh, public meeting well you want to win? yeah I just I just wanted to add that um, there is you know all the information that's in those reports is what's been presented here publicly uh, in terms, especially in terms of data and, you know, any kind of detects, non-detects kind of information, but also just to remind people that it's not supposed to be the final word on anything. It's an interim deliverable that is to document and organize what's been done and to make it accessible so people can do further analysis with the information as needed. Okay, coming back to you then. All right, so going on with the uh, project update, um, in addition to the 2017 crop reports, we have also put up the sampling field notes, which were prepared by um, Central Valley Water Board staff. We have gotten a few comments from members of the public that they have a hard time finding uh, certain documents that we put on our webpage. Um, I'd like to say if anybody has a hard time finding something, please feel free to contact me and I'd be happy to provide PDFs or help people navigate the webpage. Um, and then is it Rebecca is your contact info available directly or well I guess if they go to the the project email that you monitor that so it's not it's not by name by your name but it's the project email that they can go to correct correct the and same email that would be on the that is on the agenda 
Well, and my email goes out with the uh, public notices right, okay. too. So right. great. the public has access to that. Right. Um, Dale, did you want to give an update on the Duke study? Yeah, the update that I have on the Duke study is that there's not really an update. Um, we attempted to get together uh, a meeting between the panel members and the members of the Duke study, I think in mid-June, and that kind of fell through. We're still trying to set something up, um, and we're still working in that direction. Uh, before we move on to the next agenda item, an unrelated topic, can I uh, ask for some input from the panel that you can provide maybe Clay by the end of the week regarding the last uh, topic that we were discussing as far as the five chemicals? As Mark pointed out, uh, some of those chemicals are already being analyzed for in the water. And for example, we have about 30 results from various locations within Chevron system that show that the uh, bis 2 chloroethyl ether uh, has been non-detect since the 90s um, at relatively low detection limits and so I guess my question is is if we have information that shows that it has not historically been in the water and it's not in the water now what kind of data set would you be comfortable with saying maybe we don't need to sample for it in the fruit but if you could think about that and maybe provide some input that might be useful so uh, pose that question again. I mean, I just want to make sure it's. Do I have to? Yes, please. So if, if we have data that shows that certain constituents, but particularly the five that we're potentially adding to the crop sampling, uh, have not been detected in the water, um, you know, what kind of data set would we need to maybe say we don't need to sample for it in the fruit, or do we even want to go down that road at this point? And I'll ask that question just a little bit differently. Thank um, you. And that question is, is does there become a point? The way we've, we've looked at it so far is that, you know, we haven't used the water sampling as a, it's important to note, but we haven't used it as the sole criteria to determine whether or not something should be analyzed in the fruit. The thought has been, at least for this sampling method, while we're doing this one to two years of, of sampling of the different commodities, we should do a comprehensive analysis of, of the fruit, even if it hasn't been detected in the water, just to be able to confirm that, you know, it's, it's not any different in the treated that receives produced water for versus the control that doesn't, and it's not present at perhaps a, a, a mass or a concentration that would, would pose um, an issue to the public. Um, as we expand this list into that, this 305 constituents, you know, the question becomes, do we want to reconsider that a little bit for, future sampling to say, you know, if we have data from the water that says we have never detected it in the water, and we have a substantial body of data, you know, in this case, 30 quarterly events, um, does there become a point in time where we say that's enough to demonstrate that, you know, we don't see a variation where this shows up occasionally due to some activity that may be going on and therefore, you know, these constituents um, can be deemed not to be a threat in the produce and they don't need to be sampled in the produce. So this is a question you're wanting feedback from the panel on it. it yeah, is, and, it, and I mean, you know, this is probably more of a long-term question uh, right now. Say, yeah. You know, it's probably not an effect on the immediate sampling events. So it's more something as a, to pose the question for um, later sampling events this summer. Um, and then we'll see, we'll have the discussion about, we will have completed two years of sampling events, um, what the additional constituents are. We have some water data, 
you know, as we as we start to think about what's the end game for um, the fruit sampling, this will be an important question that perhaps we should we should have a discussion about. So For, I'm not a, sure we need an answer right now, but it is something to think about as we get to the next meeting or two. Okay, well, that, so I was going to ask from a time a time sensitivity perspective. I mean, you, you indicated that, that perhaps responses from the panel might even inform further sampling activity this summer is, I mean, which then would lead itself to believe if, that. If there's a strong opinion, um, you know, I would probably like to hear it. Um, you know, I'll, I have some thoughts as we go through and we start to see the task one and, and task two data as GSI has a chance to weigh in on this further, then I think we'll have a, a lot more information to help assess, you know, what are the specific toxicological, toxicological issues and what are our data gaps with some of this material, but ultimately, um, you know, if there is not a need to sample for something, I'm not particularly interested in requiring people to do it. I don't think the regional board, that's that's our typical approach. Um, and the question I'm asking, you know, of the panel that are the experts is, um, you know, at what point is, you know, do we say this needs to be sampled? At what point do we say we have enough data um, you know, or it's not present in the water, and therefore, how do we, how do, we, how does it influence future activities? So let me. I I heard Barbara there, so I'm I'm assuming perhaps Barbara that you wanted to weigh in on this question. I and if so, I'll come to you in a I, minute. I would like to. Yes. Okay. Um, because I, go, 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 I. Let me just I let me think, pause for a minute. I, I do, and I want to suggest that that in addition to whatever feedback the panel has today, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna, as a neutral as a facilitative neutral, I'm just gonna impose a, a suggestion, if you will. Let's go to the panel right now. But it seems that the question you're posing has fairly significant implications and, and might be of pu public interest as well. So we may want to structure this as a more proactively communicated question to the panel, maybe you know, really jot it down as a formal question, get it as part of the record, agendize it at the next meeting or, or something like that. Um, it, I mean, we can be informed of anecdotally today, um, but I'm just, I'm, I'm sensitive to the transparency nature of things and to the because it, it's a significant question, I think. So, Barbara, go ahead, please. Yes, I, I agree that we should do it in a more systematic way. But one thing I would sort of say to the, the panel as a whole is our goal originally was to look at the impact of using water, of the processed water here. And if we, even if you start finding some of these things, if they weren't in the water to start with, then controlling the water somehow is not going to make a difference. I, so it's really two different questions, and we want to be sure that we're really focusing on the impact of that water on these crops, not uh, something that may be in the soil from another source. Or, or I just think that will confuse the issue, too. Not that it's not an important question if there's something there, but it's not related to what we're trying to do. Let me look to the panel as well. Uh, Andy, go ahead. Uh, to me, this is a simple logical type question that, you know, he um, stated that there's 30 years worth of data with non-detects. I mean, how much more data do you need? Um, if I remember correctly, when we first started looking at the water quality data, whatever, three, four years ago, if I remember correctly, the panel kind of did take that approach at the beginning to look at what chemicals were detected and then start our list based on that and not be concerned about chemicals that were basically non-detected. So Clay's question to me is self-answered right there. Um, so. Well, and I agree that it's probably not worth testing because everybody knows the cost of analysis is very expensive and we should concentrate that funding to be towards chemicals that we really de need to know about. And, and let me clarify, I have 30 or so data points from different parts within the system at different times. So, 
and some of them are 30 years old. So I think we would have to look at each individual data set and see what we have for each individual discharger and see if it made sense. Okay. Uh, I, I misunderstood. I thought you had 30 years worth of data across. But mm -hmm. that didn't work either. So. <laughs> so when you say through different parts of the system, that's upstream, downstream, not just? Right. Upstream of treatment, downstream of treatment, in the canal, after blending versus in the pond before blending. Okay. Uh, let me... Um, I'm going to look to the rest of the panel here in the room, and then I'll check in, uh, in addition to Barbara, to Dave, and to Ken, just as any immediate responses to Clay's question. So any other responses here in the room to Clay's question? Okay, Dave, Ken, anything else that you would like to weigh in on beyond what Andy and Barbara have said? I don't, I don't have anything to add. Okay. Uh, me neither. Thank you. Okay. So we can agree then that this will be something that will be agendized for um, a future meeting and a more formal formal structure discussion it, particularly if it's going to result in a, a, a w the group does not provide recommendations per se or any kind of in that regard but it, again a more transparent conversation with a focused question that staff can then move away from with so all right very good all right um Regarding the Duke study, just to uh, just be a little more expansive, just if I may, on what um, what Dale had said, and, and in deference, I suppose to to regional board, it, um, I, I've been privy to the email communication, and and it, the the more the most recent response from the Duke study representatives was that they they just are their response was they're in the midst of still doing research. They didn't have anything, so it wasn't a factor. There wasn't there wasn't any. Um, uh, in inability to try to get together and, and meet or la lack of trying to schedule the, the meeting. They, they reported back and said, we really don't have anything substantive at this time. That was the most recent email. So just to, to put a little finer point on that. Andy? If I remember correctly, one of the issues for the Duke study was, you know, excess to property. I Correct. mean, is that what they're still pursuing? I, I That was certainly one of the issues, and I don't know whether there's been any activity further that that clay knows or for that matter uh, david from coelho if he has anything to report about whether any access requests have been made clay my my understanding but it's all hearsay is that they did get access um to um a farmer that has has used produced water to do some sampling but I don't have the specifics about where that's located or or what crops are being grown. David, did you have no? No. Okay. All right. So uh, the record will show that David doesn't have any information on any particular landowners in the, in the water district that have granted access. So, but yes, that that certainly was one of the topics that's been raised. So, all right. Any Rebecca? I'm just going to close out to you on this before I go to public comment or question any anything else you wanted to report from the the I mean I know that on the list on the on the agenda just to sort of close the loop on it we had the chemical additive list update but I, I think you jumped past that because that had already been addressed then by the GSI presentation correct that's correct all right all right um, any last item from the panel before I go to the public all right, we're going to open up the floor for the general public. Any questions or comments that members of the public would like to make at this time on this agenda item? Hearing none and seeing none, we will close out this agenda item. We'll move on to item six. Josh, you'll be handling this one.
Um, so the purpose of this slide is our, this presentation is to give an update on the new and expanding projects that the Water Board is dealing with right now. Um, during the last meeting in April, we did do a project update for these. Uh, this is, like I said, just an update to kind of go over new information for this stuff. So um, our new project is for EMB and Sherwood Hills. And so kind of an update on this. Uh, last time we went over the project details. Um, but basically the newest thing is that we are working on draft WDRs for this project. Um, they submitted the application. We reviewed it. We're going through the WDR process, and we are considering having them on the uh, December 2018 board meeting. Um, copies of the draft WDRs will be made available to the public um, prior to the meeting and will be available for comments as well. So we'll be reviewing those before they are actually taken to the board to be uh, considered for adoption. Um, Project details for this, just kind of summary from our last uh, meeting, is that this is for the Pozo Creek oil field, and the proposed discharge would be around 9,400 acre feet per year. Um, it's a two phase project, with the first phase consisting of um, about 1,000 acres, and the second phase being about 3,500 acres. Um, and then the proposed crops would be citrus, grapes, nuts, and uh, silager grain crops. Uh, the next project is, uh, it's already an existing project, and they're planning expanding their operations. So this is concerning uh, Hathaway, Kern Tulare Water District, and uh, Jasmine Rancho's Mutual Water Company. Um, they've already, so they have two phases. Um, the first phase we discussed last time, that's the one where the application is in progress, and we are currently working with those three operators for this project. Um, the second phase is new. And this was just recently discussed with the Water Board. And basically, this is a proposal for an additional source of produced wastewater. Um, looking at the details here, the phase one, like we talked about before, was there, you know, going increased flow from about 1,500 acre feet to about 1,800 acre feet. And the phase one would can, uh, consist of a construction of a new storage reservoir that they're referring to as the Guzman. And basically, this would provide an extra storage unit for their operations and that they could accept this additional um, wastewater flow and then be able to handle that in their day-to-day uh, -day and distribute it to the cropland and the irrigated lands area. This uh, phase two is the initial, or the new um, project, or new part of the project, and they're still in the initial design phases. Um, the actual volume that would be increased is currently unknown at this time, um, but essentially they're working with uh, California Resource and Production Corporation in the uh, Mount Pozo oil field and will be building a pipeline from that facility to their current operations or that Guzman Reservoir to accept additional produced wastewater into their um, daily use. And so kind of here's a new map. So we can see in the north, um, we've got the oil production facility, that's Hathaway. Uh, to the east, we've got the Jasmine Reservoir. Um, on the west, actually I can see we've got the big four reservoir um, over here. The new Phase one, the new reservoir would be the Guzman, which would be located approximately here. And then the California Resources Production Corporation production facility would be in this area. And essentially they're going to you know, construct a new pipeline that would take the wastewater from this production facility and transfer it to the Guzman, and then it would be distributed for use at their uh, um, irrigated sites. And so um, that pretty much kind of concludes our new updates for these two projects, for the new and expanding project. Um, are there any questions at this time? Yeah, those are all uh, north of Bakersfield? Correct. In the East Kern field. So would it be safe to say that we could expect the sa roughly the same quality of produced water that we're seeing now? Correct. Okay. Sorry. Any questions or comments from the panel here in the room? Any questions or comments from the panel on the phone? I know that Barbara had to leave, as I understand it. So, Dave and Ken, you're it. So, any I don't hear anything from you all, so we'll assume not. Will? I just have a small clarification question. Just the Guzman Reservoir is the Sherwood Hills LLC project. Is that correct? That No. no uh, that the the Guzman Reservoir. I'm, just, I'm, actually, I'm actually still here. but Oh, I Gabri I'm sorry. Gabrielle had to leave. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Barbara. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. The, the Guzman Reservoir is for Hathaway, Kern Tulare Water District, and Jasmine Rancho's Mutual Water Company. The Sherwood and EMB project, um, that's a new project that's coming in. They are going to be constructing reservoirs. It's part of their application process. We're reviewing that um, 
but it'll have separate reservoirs from the Guzman. Okay, thank you. Do you have a handle on the kind of crops we'll be growing? Uh, yeah. Yes, we have crops uh, listed for each of those projects. So pretty much the same will be uh, citrus, um, some nuts, uh, grapes, and uh, silage crops. Tillage crops. Silage. Or, silage. 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 Sorry, crops. silage, sorry. <laughs> and Dr. Longley, we're, um, I think it was um, silage and oats were the two crops, and so the first question we have on that one is, are those crops for human consumption because we have not not seen those crops used before. So that's a question that we're, we're asking but have not had answered yet. Right, because it'd be interesting to know. I, my presumption it goes to dairy and, you know, there are some food impacts with that too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any, I mean, any further response you would want from staff on no, that topic I other just, than just, uh, okay. That was my only question. All right, very good. Okay, uh, public comment. Any questions or comments from the public? I think it's still on, Bill, go ahead. Bill Alio, Environmental Working Group. Um, in prior projects, we've seen uh, the permits being issued by the regional board after the fact, after construction. There's a provision in Porter Cologne that allows for that. Are any of the two uh, projects you just described already in uh, being, are constructed or being constructed prior to issuance of the permit? Um, yeah, so the EMB and Sherwood project, they are um, in progress, um, and so they're working on that right now. And why would that be? Maybe the public should get an explanation of how a permittee can build the project and then come in and get the permit afterwards. That's not normal for most permitting agencies. In the and state and let me answer that question. I mean, they, my understanding is they are not discharging. They are building the project. They're building pipelines and, but that is at their own risk. I mean, if the board did not permit that activity and prohibited that, the cost and the, and the work that they have done would have been for naught and they would not be allowed to to use that, but they can build the facilities at their own risk. That would maybe explain to the public who may be watching or listening that that's unusual. Someone wouldn't build a hotel along the coast of California and then hope to get their coastal permit after because you've you, moved you, soil, you've moved land, you could well, disturb wetlands, well, etc. Well, so how can you build, even if you're not discharging? With all due respect, you're, the, the, that you're happens quite a lot. And it, with it, the regional water board, not with other state agencies. Right? With a lot of state agencies, um, frankly, it's it's the land use determinations that usually are are the first uh, authorization. And if they get the land use authorizations, very very common um, for other permits to get, like uh, electrical permits, other utility permits come after. And very often, when when you get the the initial permits, you start. I mean. You, Look, all around this area, there's all these grading permits issued, but there and oftentimes have not been the full package of regulatory permits being issued. That's that's pretty common. So I think the answer is the land use permits being issued by Kern County or the respective local land use agency, and they can, but they can't discharge because that's the purview of the regional board. Exactly. I mean, we've okay. we've had situations come up where, um, you know, and 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 not necessarily in this context, but. Um, uh, say like a developer really wants to get his houses in, has a small batch plant that he wants to hook up, starts building that thing, gets the uh, required approvals from the city and county to get the construction underway, and then lo and behold, when it's time to issue the waste discharge requirements, they've they've built to the wrong standards, and we've had to go back and, and revise those. And that's kind of what Clay's getting at uh, when he says they build at their own hazard. If you wound up building something that... Uh, it proposes to discharge a quality of waste that is not authorized by the board, you, you may very well have to go back to square one. So um, it's that type of assessment that the board goes into when it adopts those waste discharge requirements. Okay, thanks. Any other questions from the public or comments? All right. We are going to head and then close out uh, item six. Move on to um, seven. Any uh, general, uh, Rebecca, let me check back in with you. Any emails that have come in at this time? All right. We, uh, Dale? We did have another item on agenda item six. But, okay. The expanded, so, the expanded list. 
Yeah, what? expanded list of crops, not okay. chemicals. Oh, and, okay, and I'm sorry. We just wanted to let the public know that we have got new information from Coelho Water District and from North Kern Water Storage District about what crops are being grown, and we've posted those on our website. So, And if you have any questions, you can go ahead and give Rebecca or myself or Josh a call. Okay. Were there any significant changes or adjustments that you're aware of? Um, there's a few crops that we were not previously aware of. So. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, then let me reopen any any comments or questions from the, the panel. Public. Okay. Sorry about that. Thought we covered it all. All right. Actually, oh, Dave. Yeah. Go ahead, Barbara. Barbara. Mm -hmm. In the context of the expanded crop list. Um, as you know, I did some estimates of the food consumption for the various crops, and I just wanted to let the group know that once that list is final, I'd be happy to add any crops that are not there. So, But I thought I would just wait until we knew for sure what the list was and do it once more. Yeah, uh, Barbara, I think the list is pretty much complete. I think there are some crops in North Kern uh, that we're still trying to figure out whether or not they are used for human consumption, and as soon as we know that, we'll let you know. Yep. All right. Uh, let me open up the floor for any final questions or comments. I know that there's been a suggestion that have been made by uh, Gabrielle that I'll touch on just a minute with regard to next steps, but I'm going to open up the floor one last time for general uh, questions or comments first from the panel. Is this topic seven? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, I just wanted to bring up something that had come across my desk. Go ahead, I, move a little closer to the mic, Bruce. Sorry. sorry. Uh, that had come across my desk having to do with an EPA State of New Mexico MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, regarding produced water. And um, it kind of took me by surprise, but our new assistant administrator for water David Ross is very interested in this this alternative water supplies in general, but produced water in specifically. For whatever reason, he's had a relationship with New Mexico, which has been working on this for some time. They've done some analyses on produced water for a variety of purposes, including agriculture, um, on it, and they signed this this MOU to start doing research and just start taking a look into potential regulatory stuff. So I just wanted to bring that out to folks in case they weren't familiar with that, that uh, this was ongoing. I'm not necessarily suggesting that <laughs> EPA and the state of California get into a similar MOU, but it does say that there are activities having to do with um, agricultural use of produced water outside of our borders and that it would be, I'm going to keep tracking that myself just because it's EPA and, and such, but um, I wanted to bring that forward. Maybe it's something we should discuss. Maybe it's some folks that we should reach out to in New Mexico. I'll see if I can find some contacts there. But I did want to bring that up because it, it, I it, thought it was Is there the information that you've been privy to, is that information that is allowed to be shared such that you could provide it to staff? Well, uh, yeah, uh, this MOU is uh, okay. a public document, okay. and, I, and I passed it around cause to the folks on the panel because I had the, that as an email just as an FYI. Okay. Where we go with it, I don't know, but it, it is a public document. Um, there was also, in June of 2016, um, uh, a report to New Mexico on the regulatory framework surrounding produced water in New Mexico and impacts on potential use, which you might be familiar with because it cites California in it. And Clay there is smiling. I guess maybe you were interviewed on it. Bruce, can, can you clarify who in New Mexico, the state of New Mexico or the university? Uh, this particular document, I'll, we can, I'll get it to everybody. And make well, that's how I was going to get it, it just for uh, transparency. From the, yeah, I'm sorry. It's from Enid Sullivan Graham, the New Mexico Office of the Secretary, Energy, Minerals, and Natural Resources Department, and Los Alamos National Laboratory. So, and I'll. I'll yeah, so if we can get that well, communicated around, if there's a link. Uh, so we get it into the record. 
Yes. But exactly. I did want to bring that forward because it was interesting. All right. So we'll make an action item that Bruce okay. is going to go ahead and get that uh, provided. We'll get that. How about that be provided to Rebecca? And then we'll see if there's an actual link that folks can go to. If not, we'll get it as yeah. a PDF file just for, that, for the background section of this it's website. Really an FYI to begin with. No, right. I don't know what else we do. Okay. Uh, any other general comments or questions from the panel? All right, hearing none, seeing none. Any general comments or questions from the public? Bill Alley, Environmental Working Group. Um, we appreciate getting the agenda in advance for this food safety panel meeting. That's uh, much long awaited and, and well received. Um, on the uh, EPA issue and produced water, um, US EPA from Washington, D.C. and the region from Denver came and met this week with myself in Sacramento. Um, and they're on a tour with, they're interviewing Dogger and other people. Um, and it was about, they're about to to embark on this whole study of the use, expanded use of produced water for other beneficial uses, including agriculture. So do, are you aware of that, Mr. McClure? Uh, no, I didn't know that they had come yeah. and talked with you. Yeah, they were here on, what's today, they're on Monday. This was the assistant administrator? You know, I can't remember, the, there was an engineer. Office of Water. Yes, yeah, the Office of Water, right. That would be the assistant administrator. Da David yeah. Ross? Is no, that who you met with? it was. Uh, what's it? You remembering? Will it, we can get you those names, uh, Bruce. They they were actually there was two uh, staff, two staff engineers from uh, Office of Water in D.C. So not management level, and then two uh, scientists and an econ econ economist from uh, the Denver region. So and, and they came to talk on Dogger issues predominantly, and this and was they talked to the water boards, and they right. talked to Bill's group, and well, that's good to know. Yeah, okay. yeah. Thanks. Clay? Yeah, Bruce, just to add to that. I mean, they, they were on the tour, as Bill mentioned. Um, Dale and I and State Water Resources Control Board staff met with them yesterday morning. I believe Will and Seth Shonkoff met with them about noon. So there was a, a contingent that came through. Um, they did mention New Mexico that, you know, the, the question, one of the questions and probably one of the most interesting aspects of this is that they, they stated that New Mexico says that they're an extremely water short area and that, you know, there's a lot of interest in finding new sources of water um, and I told, you know, basically my comment to them was don't think that New Mexico is the only state that's got that particular issue that with the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act that's coming and our groundwater conditions in the southern San Joaquin Valley, it is my personal belief that, you know, finding alternative sources of water um, is going to be something that's going to be looked at very carefully and it would be my expectation that you know where there are good quality waters to be had um, there will be an interest to see whether or not those can be used as alternative sources of water to help support um, the overall water use within the San Joaquin Valley so um, I don't think this practice is going to go away and recycling of, of these types of water is likely to be, um, you know, something that, that is sought after um, by various entities in the future. All right. Okay. Uh, thank you, Bill. So uh, moving on to uh, action items. Um, uh, Gabrielle has requested, and I, I think there's some merit to this, and we have done this in the past. It's not been terribly common, but as we have stated in, in, for the public record, there have been times where the panel has felt the need to do just an internal panel meeting. By far, the predominant number of meetings that have taken place have really been panel meetings in the context of a public meeting. Gabrielle has made a request that 
there be a, a, a panel meeting, an inter internal panel meeting, to just basically talk about what's the long range critical path now of the project, what's the schedule, what's going to be the um, anticipated maintained role by the panel, or perhaps a revised role. So um, I'm putting that out there as a general request by one of your, your panel members. We've certainly done these conversations by conference call in the past and in public. So um, I'm going to look first to staff to see if there's any apprehension that you would have about doing such a conversation. I mean, we, we've talked anecdotally in the past about how long does this go? And I don't mean that pejoratively, just you know, how, how long does the, the panel process go? So thoughts about this, Clay? My personal opinion is is that that meeting is needed, um, you know, and then we would be ready to discuss the results of that meeting um, at the next public meeting. And, and it was something that I was going to bring up, not in the context of this meeting, but, you know, I would, I would support that idea. Okay. And, and as a reminder for the public, uh, when those internal meetings have happened, infrequent as they may be, uh, the, there have been meeting summaries prepared, and those have been a matter of public record as well. So they, it, it remains a uh, transparent uh, memorialization. I'm going to look to the, the panel. So again, um, it's, a, it's a general where is this going, kind of a long-range planning kind of question. What's the long-range roles and responsibilities? What's the, you know, the impacts and sort of long-range resource impacts to you all as panel members? Anybody opposed to that kind of a conversation? I'll submit to you that I think that that kind of a conversation is something that could reasonably be done by conference call amongst us. And certainly we could do it in an in-person location if, for folks that are here in Sacramento as well, but for those that are not. So anybody on the panel opposed to that suggestion? Okay, then then we'll yeah we'll go ahead. And presumably, you I have would one be comment. As much as possible, I think we ought to think about having it in person rather than just a conference call. Okay. All right. Okay, so we'll uh, we'll move ahead then as an action item to uh, start working on on coordinating schedules to do that, and along the lines of what Will said, to the extent possible in person. Um, okay. Remaining agenda items is that we will have feedback provided by noon on Friday to the uh, immediate question that Clay had asked about the, uh, the five additional uh, constituents. We will um, look to a future meeting, the next meeting, to have a more robust and sort of structured conversation about, uh, which will ideally be both a, a robust kind of specified question as well as a bit more data um, in a concrete way regarding the water water analysis that's been done to date in these sort of different locations and time frames um, with the intent of getting specific input from the panel as to whether there might be constituents, the data of which shows might be reasonable to pull off the uh, long range sampling regimes. We would aim for that to be at the next meeting and we will look for there to be a um, interim meeting by the panel uh, to discuss long-range planning. I think that I've touched on all the agenda or the action items. Was there anything, Josh, else that you had or no? Okay, good. Okay, uh, I will look to staff, to Clay. Any uh, Clay and, and Patrick action for that matter? Any, any closing comments? I just have one very last item besides thanking everybody for attending the panel's participation. I want to say thank you very much for participating in this very important subject to the water boards. And one last note, I want to thank Dave Sepos because the panel is not aware of this yet, but um, Dave's not been going to be able to facilitate our future meetings, and he actually agreed to facilitate this one at no cost to the state, for which I am extremely thankful, and I just want to say thank you very much, Dave, for all of your help, but we'll be um, having other facilitation services for our next meeting. Thanks, Dave. My pleasure. So, okay, with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>